Hello, you're listening to the Eric McKenna Project. Appreciate it, man. Yeah, it's great to be back. Yeah, yeah. finally. Yeah, right, definitely miss it. It's been a it's been a long year. So <laughs> can well. we have a discussion on math? Sure. Okay. Love math. <laughs> Let me just set this up. To my understanding, growing up, math was this language that we as young people just assumed was the language of everything, and some super geniuses must have figured it out, and it was always there, and that's the only way that we know to describe the universe and everything everything describes everything Mm -hmm. but in terms of the origin of math math essentially was a man-made construct right we had to come from somewhere yeah i'm guessing it built over time right math is a man-made construct pretty similar to the way that like chemistry is a man-made construct like clearly we didn't invent like the particles that are interacting with each other to form atoms and molecules however the description of how those atoms and molecules are interacting with each other is man-made um but that doesn't mean it's arbitrary right because you can't just pick any description you want and have it be internally consistent with the vast menagerie of ways that particles are able to interact with each other. Okay. Um, And so math is a similar sort of thing. It's man-made in the sense that it's a set of sort of symbols and little linguistic remarks Mm -hmm. that allow you to describe quantity and Mm -hmm. and, and, and the relations between quantities. Um, However, it's clearly not arbitrary. there are some elements of it that you do have to make certain choices, and we can get into that. Yeah. you know, getting when we get into okay. history a little more. Okay. Um, but but we are constrained in some sense, and one that's one of the more interesting things about math is, in a sense, it's a very creative field in which you can invent. Imagine that you had a system that obeyed these rules. How if you started writing on a piece of paper how the system would play out, um, what would it look like, right? And so that's what a lot of modern day mathematicians do is they say, here are the objects in my mathematical system, here are the rules that they obey, uh, and let's try and prove some theorems that you know follow from these rules and from these objects. Okay. However, when we do that, strangely 50 years later, some physicists will be trying to explain some weird phenomenon in like a plasma and then they'll be like, oh, there was this math paper 50 years ago that has exactly this structure in it. And so that's the sense in which math is both creative and made up, but at the same time, one of the things that puzzles scientists and mathematicians is why is it so good at describing the world? Like, things that we thought we just totally made up, um, end up just popping up in nature in ways that are completely completely unexpected. Okay. Um, pretty much every time we deploy math in nature, that math was invented for like a totally different purpose. And it just seems like a coincidence that, that it fit there. Um, you know, the sort of math that underlies quantum mechanics, for example, it was not invented for quantum mechanics. It was invented for a completely different purpose, for okay. a- answering completely different questions that at the time were like abstract, theoretical, huh. mathematical questions. Okay. And this is like a recurring theme in general. It's probably the only exception to this is like Isaac Newton, who, you know, the 17th century British mathematician, mm-hmm. philosopher, polymath, whatever, he... Apple guy. The, the guy <laughs> that, yeah, that gravity didn't exist before. <laughs> I know. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, Isaac Newton, he needed to invent calculus in order to make sense of and use his theory of physics. Okay. And so that's one case where it was like this math was invented because there was a sort of like physical application in mind. Um, and so so that's a little bit that's okay. a little bit but other other than that, that was more specific. That was more specific okay. where it was like he invented a language and a description and it served a purpose and its purpose was to do this thing that was related to nature and that and like that's kind of how we think maybe all of math is like but but that's not the case. Um, so so yeah. So we could talk about like a brief history. Yeah, of math let's, 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 let's do if that. If the viewers will allow me, let's to. absolutely. <laughs> okay, great. Yeah, you um, got the floor, pal. Sweet. Um, so yeah. So math originally, I would say, probably served two kinds of purposes. One is sort of to understand the night sky. Um, 
Nowadays, we have Netflix, and so we don't have to look at the sky. Uh, whenever it's dark outside, we can stay inside and look at that instead. <laughs> but a long time ago, for half of your existence, there was really, it was very hard to see. Like, you had fires and candles and stuff. Right. But besides that, for, like, half of your existence, most of what you're kind of looking at when you're, like, out there in the world is this giant, beautiful display. Without pollution. Without light pollution. Right. Without actual, just particulate pollution. Right. Um, and so you could see just, like, the mil- you could see the... Um, the actual plane of the disk of the Milky Way in the night sky. Got you can see you can see about six thousand stars. Wow! Um, and so people were like, "What's going on with all that? Like, what is?" And, and there are a few really bright ones that seem to wander around. And we found out that those things were planets. But anyways, we tried to understand this. We tried to <clears throat> make predictions based off of these stars and things like that. Um, and to do that, you needed some sort of system that described locations of objects in some sort of two-dimensional space, like how high off the horizon, how far over, right? Um, you needed to be able to measure these things and that, that was two d- today two, we two call d- angles. Because it's two-dimensional. What we were looking yeah. at at that time, they, the concept of 3D wasn't, man had not figured that out, right? Especially with regards to astronomy, where it was like people thought that those things were probably just like points of light that were all at the same exact location. Um, as a matter of fact, they thought they weren't really that far away, like where the actual points of light were coming from. You got it. Um, well, how could they? Yeah. I mean, you, you have no idea. Right. Um, and <clears throat> so anyways, okay, I could go on a few tangents there, but that's okay. Let's, uh, we let's got time, buddy. Keep, <laughs> we we'll, got time. We'll keep our eye on the prize okay. if we go back down that way. So okay. anyways, math was used to try and understand astronomy. Math was also used to try and um, really engineering and business to be able to do Mm. that better. So like some of our earliest forms of math in a formal sense where it's like actual symbols and like numbers and things like that is ancient Babylonians. And so this is like 2600 BC, something like that. Um, Pyramid era? Making the pyramids? Yeah, so the pyramids were Egyptian, um, and so at the same time, the Egyptians were doing a similar thing. So, okay. like, the oldest math is, like, Mesopotamia, which is, like, where Iraq is yeah, now. Yeah. So that was, like, the Babylonians, um, okay. later, like, the Assyrians, okay. Sumerians, people like that. And then also in the Nile um, is where the Egyptian, the old kingdoms of, mm-hmm. of, of Egypt were. And they used math... Um, uh, largely because of religion. They wanted to like build really impressive structures like okay. pyramids and things like okay. that. Um, there were actually in ancient Greece, and this is even like before Plato, there was a guy named Pythagoras who actually Pythagoras invented from Pythagorean theorem. He invented like literally like a whole religion based off of math. Um, he thought that let that there that math was this structure that undergirds reality he was correct in that but he kind of took he it to he figured that out then yeah so this was like i don't know maybe 500 bc this was a long time ago um so this was you know 2000 years after the babylonians and the egyptians but it was like before a lot of like the kind of archimedes more fancy math in the later okay. periods of greece so this is ancient ancient greece and he but he took it to the point it was like a cult they were like all like vegan and like didn't have they didn't believe in like individual ownership of possessions they Mm -hmm. were like very Mm -hmm. secretive and um but they did some of the first sort of experiments in nature to see that math was hidden inside of all of nature uh so for example you're a music guy yeah and you probably know that Mm -hmm. whenever you take you know strings of different Mm -hmm. lengths or pipes of different lengths that these things correspond to different sounds absolutely um this sort of relationship between two different notes that have a sort of consonant beautiful sound the interval there mm-hmm. that is related to the relative size oh, of absolutely. these things and so it's mathematics it, so Music's mathematics exactly so that was something that pythagoras saw as evidence where he was like look if i take a pipe that's this length and take a pipe that's made of the same stuff and it's twice as long notice they make the same sound what we would call today they're like an octave apart um and so the frequency is doubling um where the length is having right okay. or the frequency can is I having get, can i ask a sidebar yeah absolutely. okay just, i won't remember to come back to this okay it's sure. always on my mind mm-hmm. i listen to a lot of jazz mm-hmm. a lot of the 70s jazz where it's uh, out there it, it, so in, the catchphrase is, oh, that rubs a little bit, mm-hmm. where it doesn't sound musically correct. It mm-hmm. sounds like things are in um, non-correct keys sometimes. Mm-hmm. 
is that more a human determination because the math doesn't care right that 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 note is is not supposed to be in that chord or that note is not supposed to be in that scale is that a human just a, a, a human decision based upon what we're hearing or is that fundamentally mathematically incorrect it is both um okay so um you know what makes up a chord again is not some sort of like arbitrary decision um i want to be careful here so there is a mathematical reason why c e g Mm -hmm. right the the first the third and the fifth that they sound the way they do um what is sort of human is whether we like that sound or got it right and so so whenever something rubs a little bit oftentimes that's intentional and it's like in jazz it's sort of like meant to sort of like you know freeze you for a second because you're expecting something and then all of a sudden something sort of unexpected happens right um and mathematically like that actual vibration that actual sound wasn't fitting into a pattern Got that, it. that that this other music was and it's a, it's a describable pattern and right. and like the intonation of a scale mm-hmm. is something that actually mm-hmm. forms a mathematical pattern but whether we say that pattern is something that we want to follow or not that is our consciousness that's sort of like interpreting the signals of so these that's vibrations human. that's yeah. human a feeling I mean, an emotion almost. yeah okay. i guess in a way you know i'm going to give you like the following sequence right okay. two four six eight ten eleven twelve fourteen sixteen that 11 like rubbed a little bit right mm-hmm. and you could say like was that human or was that math and it's like well it's the only one that isn't it, that wasn't an even number so we were like obviously it's math in a sense but like who cares that i said like how did we decide that that was something that was sort of like a break in the pattern that was happening so that's kind of the way to put it i understand there's mathematical justification okay you know okay different societies like western music and eastern music they choose different sorts of patterns which makes that's the beauty of music uh, there's the different scales and the modes i mean that's as a guitar player that's the but but i always wondered you know we in Western culture, this particular scale, this particular mode, is not right. Mathematically, to our ears, we would we would go like this. Yeah. In other other cultures, that's a perfectly normal, expected group of notes. Yeah, 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 you know? totally. Um, yeah, and then there's this whole other side thing, which I'm not a music theorist, but there's things called like just intonation. I've heard that um, before. Well, you're talking, you're talking in semitones, you're taking yeah, so much so off the actual true notes. The right? way that you actually um, tune an instrument is, is a choice that you make. No doubt. Where you can kind of say like, do What's you, the history of that? Do you know? I do not know the history yeah, of that. I don't yeah, either. I'd like, I, to, I'd like to figure that out. I think it's not as old as, as we might think that. Like, I think a lot of these sort of decisions about... Um, tuning are a little bit maybe more modern if I had to wow, guess because okay. I mean the piano isn't isn't really that old it's right. like 1600s or something right. so anyways yeah so the choice to make um, the keys on a piano the way they are you know different cultures would would put the next highest note at a slightly different frequency based off whether you're trying to break up an octave in equal Absolutely. increments of frequency space uh-huh. or whether you're trying to make them sort of like equal ratios of each other and things like that okay. so so there's right. a lot oh, I, of I appreciate it. Yeah, yeah, no problem. Take you off your game there. But. Yeah. No, no, no. Where is it all? Okay. So anyways, like Pythagoras, you know, largely because of music, but because of other things as well, realizes that math, like back then, the only math they had was like very simple. Like they didn't have um, what we would call algebra was like something that they did not have any understanding of. So like they huh. had the notion of like quantity and they had the notion of ratio. Okay. Um, and, you know, they, they had like exponents, but not in the way that we sort of understand them in a modern way. They just knew that like you can multiply a thing by itself. Um, and, and all of their notions of what quantity and ratio were, were very tied up in geometry as mm-hmm. well. Mm-hmm. Um, so we, we'll get into that in a moment. But basically, Pythagoras starts to realize that like math is out there in a way that's like kind of mystical, right? And so he... But, he, are, but he's kind of creating it, right? Like, or is, is it building from what came before him or elements coming before him? So like I said, he started like, you know, hitting metal things and changing their size. So it's almost empirical. Okay. You know, math is like empirical in that sense. Okay. So that that's where it's like an interesting dual-edged sword where the one hand it's creative because you can just make up certain ideas in math and then just sort of see what comes from them okay um i'll talk about some more modern okay. math that haven't found their way into physics yet in, in a bit um but at the other hand it's empirical in the sense that like 
sometimes you'll happen upon a theorem in your formal system of yeah. symbols and rules and you'll yeah. be like i didn't know that was going to be there ahead of time and it's like a really profound interesting theorem that at 100 years later shows up as being like you know related to the like conservation of energy in physics or something like that okay and so in that sense it's a very empirical thing but in the other sense you made up those rules but why did you make up those particular rules like not all rules lead to very interesting theories understood right? so it's a bit complicated um Okay, so yeah, so we're starting to realize Babylonians, Egyptians, they're able to do things like long division, they're able to, the Pythagorean theorem mm -hmm. um, is actually way predates Pythagoras in terms of its use, so like that, a couple thousand years before him, the Babylonians wow. knew the Pythagorean theorem. Um, and of course, it wasn't really expressed as an equation, um, as a general symbolic equation because they didn't have algebra back then. But there are tablets written in cuneiform, which is like the writing system of Babylonians, of numbers that satisfy these Pyth this okay. Pythagorean relationship and diagrams that show when and why you use it. Um, so we are very sure that they knew about this thing. Um, by the way, if you're just hearing about, the, you can't remember what the Pythagorean theorem is for listeners, the Pythagorean theorem is a very conceptually interesting theorem okay. because what it does is it sort of connects the different dimensions of space. And you might not have heard of it kind of put that way, but no. let me explain. Okay. This ha this will have importance whenever we start getting into this guy. Yeah, yeah. Right? Um, so what the, you know, if you go to the right a couple steps, you're able to sort of like use a ruler and like measure distances like going off to the right, right? Okay. So you can like draw a line and you can put equal increment tick mm -hmm. marks and then you have a notion of distance in this direction. And then you can turn in some you know 90 degree angle some orthogonal direction you mm -hmm. say perpendicular and then you could kind of do the same thing in this direction okay but the question then becomes like if i go three this way in four this way mm -hmm. i know i have to walk you know seven blocks to do that mm -hmm. you know three blocks east you know four mm -hmm. blocks north but the question is if i wasn't stuck on this random grid that i made if i was a bird how far away did I actually go? So that's right. So that in a sense is like, how do I connect going to the right and going up? What is sort of the path that goes through both of those dimensions simultaneously, okay. both right and up? And that's what the Pythagorean theorem is telling you. It's what it's saying is that it's not seven, right? It's something that's a little bit less than seven because in some sense you're, go you're taking a shortcut, right? Um, it's definitely more than three and it's definitely more than four. It's in between the larger of three and four and seven, but how much is it? Okay. And what Pythagoras tells you is that it's actually very simple. You take three, you multiply it by itself. You take four, you multiply it by itself. And when you add those together, that result should be that distance, distance. multiplied by itself. And so in that case, you get three squared is nine, four squared mm -hmm. is 16, nine and 16 is Got 25. It. So that's five, the square root Got of it. 25 is five. So, so <clears throat> why I describe it in this weird way of connecting dimensions is because fast forward all the way to, you know, the 19th century, we realize we could have picked a lot of different ways to connect these dimensions together. It didn't have to just be a squared plus b squared equals c squared. It could have been a squared plus 2ab plus b squared, or it could have Got been it. a cubed plus b cubed. So like, that's where math gets creative. In the 19th century, we started picking different Pythagorean theorems. Okay. Those led to space being different, right? Because the dimensions are connected differently. Got it. And then all of a sudden Einstein comes around and is like, oh, actually that explains what space time is, right? That's so crazy, this, this yeah. fun that's, game that's of you crazy. just making up a new Pythagorean theorem empirically describes like gravity in the world around us. Um, so, so yeah, so that's kind of that's a fascinating incredible. thing about math. Um, okay, so um, moving forward a little bit from Pythagoras, this is you know, we got a few thousand years to cover. So um, <laughs> moving forward to Pythagoras, we get to say like Euclid, which is maybe around 200 BC. So this is several okay. hundred years, you know, after Pythagoras. Okay. And what Euclid does is he sort of sets the stage for what math is to become, I think, like in, in the future. In hot, in um, way. Euclid writes a book uh, called The Elements of Geometry. And what this book is, is it's sort of the... It's a description of geometry. It talks about triangles. It talks about squares and circles and like how to like construct different shapes. Um, but it, most importantly, what it does is it sets up the way in which math is to be done. And the, the, in the following way, he says, these are the axioms. So that's a word meaning these are the sort of irrefutable truths. Mm -hmm. I have a point and I have a point. 
under those circumstances, there exists a line that connects those two points. That's like an axiom mm-hmm. of Euclid's elements, right? And there's and there's five of them in his book, just five. Four of them are very simple, straightforward things, like there's a line that connects two points. The fifth one is really weird. Okay. The fifth one says, if you have a line and you have a point, there's only one line you can draw through that point that never meets the bottom line. The parallel line. So that's so this is the parallel line. This is called the parallels postulate. Okay. And it's a little bit weird because it's sort of talking about infinity. It's saying it never meets the other line. Ever. And so it's sort of saying that all the way out infinitely far, we still haven't touched it. And that's very different than the finite kind of properties of you have a point, you have a point, draw a line between it. And so for thousands of years, people were trying to like prove the parallel postulate from the other four. The other four are so self-explanatory and fundamental. Got it. Okay, so anyways, we're g- there's a very interesting story about the parallel postulate we'll get on. So that's Euclid. He has these five axioms. And then he says, here's how you basically with the, the modern la- day way to phrase it would be here are the rules of inference that from these five axioms here's how you sort of combine them to come up with new mathematical knowledge okay. new theorems um, and a simpler version of this would be like if I have an equation I'm allowed to subtract the same thing from both sides mm-hmm. right mm-hmm. like x plus 4 equals 5 I can subtract 4 from both sides to get x equals 1 that's a way to solve right. that equation right. so that's a rule of inference that says like what are you allowed to do you have some axioms about what plus means, what equals means, okay. and then like, what are you allowed to do, okay. right? Um, and so from this, he derives just tons and tons of theorems, which basically say, starting from these axioms, you can combine them and do all sorts of things. For him, the rules were actual physical. For him, it was, if you have a compass, which is like a thing that allows you to draw a circle, mm-hmm. and a straight edge, which is just basically mm-hmm. a ruler without the tick marks, then you can draw certain shapes. Those are the rules of inference, like drawing shapes. Right. Um, So he comes up with all these theorems, and a lot of them are like things that, you know, you know sort of intuitively to be true, but you wouldn't really know how to prove that they're true. But he's able to prove it just from all this stuff. This literally just a couple hundred years ago, like 150 probably years ago, you would be able to go into a middle school and see a copy of Euclid's Elements as the math textbook that kids were using. Oh, really? So this was a math textbook that was used for 2,000 years. It lasted and that long. N- yeah, no other... No revisions, nothing. Yeah, I mean, like, it had to be translated from, yeah. like, Greek, and then, like, the Arabs eventually, like, translated it, expanded upon it. The theory grew. There were geometers. was, like, a thing that you did. Um, but, yes, yeah, so it was something that was, like, you know, one of the few pieces of knowledge that sort of undisturbed, you know... Huh. You know... Even like the Bible gets different translations oh, yeah. and interpretations yeah. like that, but like Euclid's elements are things. Um, and again, it's because of this weird thing. Euclid picked these axioms, he picked what a compass and a straight edge was, so it seems like it's made up. But at the same time, what people realize is like using Euclidean geometry, you can build a skyscraper, like Got you it. can like do things. It gives you magical powers in a sense, it allows Got you to, it. you know, one of the things that, um, the Pythagoreans did sorry to jump back in time a little bit which is another reason why math is not just a made up language is they started on one side of the island that they were on Mm -hmm. I forget whether there's Samos maybe they're in one of the uh, islands in the Aegean Sea off the coast of Turkey they started on one side and started digging a tunnel this way and then started on the other side and dug a tunnel this way and the tunnels met perfectly in the middle and Based like upon that map and they and, and like that's something that like nowadays we kind of take for granted but can you imagine not having any sort of like gps technology calculators anything and you have this project that you and your friends are going to do which is i'm going to start here you're going to go a hundred miles around to the other side and you're going to look underground and you're going to start burying underground and we're going to meet in the center of this, like, 5,000 foot. <laughs> like, it's totally insane that they could do that. So that's what I mean by math gives you superpowers in a Got sense. It. It's something that, like, Got no it. other sort of creatures could do something like that. Um, so so clearly math is out there in the world. Um, and now that Euclid basically made such a perfect math, we can fast forward to the 1800s okay. because it's like, you know, of course, in the meantime, uh, in around 9, I guess, no, probably like 700, 800 is one um the Arab mathematician Al Khwarizmi, who was making a book to help um, merchants sort of like balance their ledgers, okay. he invents algebra. Um, algebra um, 
is really just comes from an Arabic word that has to do with like subtracting the same thing from both sides. It's basically like an operation. Right. Um, and it's one of the operations in his book that explains how to like manipulate equations. Okay. So he invents algebra um, and the Arabic numeral system, right? One, two, three, four, those all come from that time period. Um, eventually, I think it was the Indians maybe that realized that zero is kind of a big deal. <laughs> and so he's, he's in, you know, the Middle East was in communication with China and India. And so all these things start to synthesize um, in the okay. Middle Ages. The West was just completely in shambles at this point, right? Post Roman civilization, there was like a thousand years where like not a whole lot of useful stuff came out of Europe or the Got Mediterranean. It. That it. mostly everything was Black coming. plague. <laughs> yeah, they were, they were <laughs> dealing with rats and, and, and yeah fleas so yeah basically baghdad and damascus were like the centers of learning and 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 at least our sort of half of the world of course right. like china and india were doing their thing but a lot of math today trigonometry algebra decimal system um zero a lot of these things actually come from the middle east and the east yeah. um and if it wasn't for the middle east we would not we would probably be like way far behind right yeah. now because they sort of saved antiquity mm -hmm. from complete destruction like all of this progress that the greeks made a lot of it the only source that we have of a lot of these things i'm telling you right now is because is from latin translations of arabic translations of greek no kidding. it was literally the the sort of like yeah something like the um abbasid caliphate was spending like four percent of their GDP or something like translating ancient Greek texts wow. in this in this massive structure that. called the House of Wisdom, which was in Baghdad, which was kind of like the first university in a sense, okay. the first maybe research university. Okay. Um, so, anyways, like that's like we owe a lot of our sort of cultural heritage dating back to the Romans and Greeks, actually to the golden age of islam which happened between like 700 and 1200 ad okay for sort of saving all that from okay. just like the the dark ages in europe um so anyways things were starting to get better then the renaissance happened and then europe sort of grabbed the torch from there you have like galileo mm -hmm. you have you know, isaac newton obviously um and now we're kind of into like the 1800s and this is where people started getting really creative okay and they sort of realized because up until then you know we we're inventing math to build buildings. We're inventing math to balance ledgers, right? We're inventing math to prove things about triangles. But in the 1800s, we started to be like, we can invent math just to invent math. Like we could just make a new rule of how multiplication works and just see what happens, Okay. right? And so that started to happen. People started getting like really creative and saying five times six is 30 and six times five is 30. That's interesting. You can do it either way. What would math be like if you couldn't do it either way? So like, you know, these sort of questions is what were people asking. One of the questions people started jumping on was the Pythagorean theorem and the parallel postulate. Um, what they proved was that not only could you not prove the parallel postulate from the other four, it's actually completely independent. You can come up with a whole new version of geometry where the parallel postulate says the opposite thing, that given a line and a point, there are an infinite number of lines that never intersect the the other line. Um, given a no, line... Back up, back up, wait, wait, what? <laughs> yeah, yeah, so that one's hyper... That's called hyperbolic geometry. It's a little bit harder to visualize. Let's do the other one. Given a line and a point, every line intersects the given line. So that's called spherical geometry, and that's a little bit easier. Okay. So imagine earth the sphere um a line on earth is what happens if you are standing on earth and you go straight and you never turn it turns out that if you go straight and you never turn what you will do is cut the earth in half right. your line will make what basically you know is like the equator only at whatever direction you started going right okay so that's what a line is because we're sitting on a sphere because we're on a sphere that's right. what a line is on a sphere um what's important here is that it's not a line of latitude so, like, where if you start at 40 degrees latitude around where Pittsburgh is and you go around that way, you actually have to continually turn left in yeah, order to do curved. that. Yeah, that's a curved line. Yeah, that would be a curved line. But the equator is not a curved line. The mm -hmm. equator is a straight line. Mm -hmm. If you went, you know, east starting at the equator, you'd stay on the equator. You right. would never turn. Um, okay, great. So, if you have the equator, which is a line, and then you have a point, Pittsburgh, mm -hmm. there are no lines you can draw through Pittsburgh that don't hit the equator at some point. 
okay. because you can't cut the Earth in half Got it. without going through the equator at some Got point. It. Um, and you know, you might be thinking, what about just kind of staying parallel to the, this parallel notion you have in your head is because you're in zooming out in three dimensional space and <clears throat> you're looking at a globe and you're looking at these two latitude lines as parallel. No, no, I'm talking about the geometry of the globe itself, not like what it's like when you're in three dimensions. Understood. Space. <clears throat> okay, great. So that's an example of how the parallel postulate could be wrong, that like maybe there are no lines that are parallel in that okay. sense, right? Okay. Um, and so basically these people, Bulyai, Lobachevsky, Gauss, Gauss, you may have heard of this yeah. German guy. Oh, yeah. They invented, they basically inverted the parallel postulate to be like, what would be the geometry? Let's just go through and rewrite Euclid's whole book only with a different fifth axiom. Okay. Um, and where this isn't, this is totally creative. It's just like, they just did it because you could do it. Um, <laughs> because they were like, okay, like what would, if they're independent and they're, we're not going to get any contradictions right. by, 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 right, saying right, the, right. by negating it. Um, and so what you get is like, if you say that there's infinitely many lines, then that would be what's called hyperbolic geometry. Mm -hmm. If you mm -hmm. get no parallel lines, it's called spherical geometry. Um, and it's just made up. But what, again, we learned circa 1915, whenever Einstein was trying to understand space and time as one larger four-dimensional thing, that four-dimensional thing is not Euclidean geometry. That four-dimensional thing is some kind of weird version of a hyperbolic geometry okay. um, that, again, it, it obeys these different rules of geometry that these people just made up. Like, they didn't know about space-time. They didn't know about, like, you know... That's pretty remarkable. Yeah, so that's that's something that's like really interesting about math. That I want to push back on the notion that it's all made up in the sense that like it's not like English, which is is a language, and well, they were objective, right? Yeah, I mean, like there's you could maybe linguists here, you know, would probably push back a little bit. Um, I don't know if you know you know Noam Chomsky. Yes. Um, yeah. So. Yes. Um, before he was into politics, he's very into linguistics. Didn't and know that. Yeah. So that that's actually what like he kind of was famous for. He Got was it. like like a world renowned ling linguist. Um, and his one of his major ideas in linguistics was that um, that it's really weird how good we are at learning language as like infants and toddlers. That it just is unreasonable with how few instances of sentences that we get in the first like year and a half of our life mm -hmm. that we're able to master incredibly complex sentence structures that like the actual rules of English grammar can be pretty tricky, but somehow like toddlers don't make certain mistakes about, they don't make certain grammatical mistakes, which seem like you should probably make them. Well, what's his inference then? Um, what is and, he trying to and say? So his idea is that language is maybe there might be there must be some sort of like proto language of sorts that is sort of hard coded inside okay. of our brains, okay. and that every there must be what's called a universal grammar that every language is just a sort of variant of that wow, there are certain deep. yeah that there that's are structures deep. inside of grammar that like. Indo-European languages, like you know, even like Far East, like Japanese and English, and all. So maybe they're based off of some human element. Yeah, that that actually there's like something in the brain that is sort of hard coded that already understands a proto language, and then once you start hearing English sentences, you just know how to apply your proto language to English. So this is a. T I am not a linguist, so this yeah, is like a. To deep. This is my sort <clears throat> of like interpretation of the idea of universal grammar, and it's okay. like it's it's a bit more complex. But the idea is that maybe even human language isn't as subjective as you think. But anyways, let's say that human language is pretty subjective for all pr our purposes, okay. in the sense that like this thing is called a chair. The sound t air has nothing to do with the shape of this or what you do with it, and so like it's made up, right? Mm -hmm. um, and but math, in a sense, while it can be made up. It can be this totally creative thing. It just keeps popping back up in nature. And so it's almost like nature is already math in a sense. And as we try and like explore the world of math, we're actually exploring nature without having to like build a part so of it. So instead of cr like creating math, could we be discovering or uncovering math? Yes. It's and already there. Many people would say that sort of thing where it's just like, they are they are uncovering math. They're they're sort of making mathematical discoveries, not like you know. And what's your thoughts? Yeah, so I think that it's it's uh, hmm. 
Ah, if I had st- to take I stumped him. <laughs> if I have to, like, yeah, I'm trying to, like, see if, if I'm kind of have to pick a side here. Like, where would I sort of lean? Is math something you discover or is it something that you create? Um, Could it be a little of both? Is there a cop-out answer? That's, yeah. I mean, obvi- that's that would be my choice. But if I had to not take the cop-out answer, how would I sort of, like, come mm-hmm. down on that mm-hmm. sort of thing? Where my head is sort of spinning is, like, in what sense is reality discovered versus made that you know our perception is a sort of interpretation of our mind in a lot of ways too um, okay. and that like you know when you see just a common stupid example like purple mm-hmm. um there isn't a photon that is the color purple like there are photons that are red and there are mm-hmm. photons that are green mm-hmm. but there are certain colors that we experience in our mind that are not sort of like physical correlates of a specific thing in nature. So you're saying they're not real. I'm saying that our brain works in an interesting way where we have these three different color receptors in our retina and that they are excited to different degrees by different kinds of light hitting them. And our brain has to take that level of excitement of these receptors and it has to basically tell a visual story of what that means to our consciousness right okay and so in a sense like we are inventing the color purple but it's also obviously out there in the world do you know what i mean Mm -hmm. and so Mm -hmm. i think math is a similar sort of thing where it's like this interplay between like we're sort of like logically ordering the world around us we're sort of making sense of the world um in this very sort of creative act of like making these choices to like find patterns and things like that um and what patterns we find interesting just like jazz are sort of Mm -hmm. like a human choice Mm -hmm. in a sense um but at the same time like it's not a coincidence that like when i told you the story about gauss and bolyai and lavachevsky they weren't all working together like somewhere in Hungary, somewhere in Germany. Point, right. So like it's clearly already out there in a way. Um, and so, so yeah, so I think yeah, the whole thing gets a little esoteric too. It is. It is a bit. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I would say it's, it's kind of, it's discovered that math is discovered in the way that anything is discovered in the sense that like when it, when we make a discovery in physics, we sort of made a specific choice to try and look for a specific pattern in a particular circumstance. Got it. Um, you know, Got it. the discovery of general relativity in an empirical sense, one of the first experiments to say general relativity that space time is curved is a thing. One of the first actual experiments was looking at a solar eclipse. Do you know this story? I didn't know. This is, huh. a, this is a nice one. Basically, okay. you know, because this stuff about like matter curves space time, like what does that even mean? Right. But a really concrete example of that is, okay, in Newtonian physics, mm-hmm. when you drop a rock, the rock falls. Mm-hmm. When you shoot a light beam, it doesn't fall. That right. light just kind of goes straight, Correct. right? Um, but in Einstein's theory, light is still moving inside of space time. And if space time's curved, that light's going to curve. <laughs> like it, it doesn't matter okay. you know, whether it's a rock or whether it's okay. light, it's going to curve. Okay. Right? That if you shine a flashlight, it goes in general relativity. Okay. It might be really light might go really fast. And so you might not be able to see it very well. You might need the curvature of space time to be really large in order for it to be a noticeable yeah, effect. Got it. But nonetheless, it curves no matter what. So this right? is, we, we've proven this experiment. So right? here's the experiment you could do. Okay. okay? So if you work out the numbers, If you shine a laser pointer, you're never going to be able to see this thing full. That, like, if I shine a laser pointer at the wall, yes, it will be down a little bit lower, but by smaller than, like, the radius of a nucleus or something. So, like, it's not going to matter. So, what you need is something that's heavier than the Earth, and you got to get pretty close to it. So, Hmm. what's heavier than the Earth? What's, What's the heaviest thing in the solar system? The sun? Exactly. There's a reason we call it the solar system, not the Earth system. Right. Right. So, the sun is most of the mass of the solar system. Okay. So, we need light that is going like close to the sun. We need to shine a laser pointer on the sun and see if it curves. So how could we do that? Well, we could look at the stars behind the sun Mm -hmm. and see if they're in a different location Uh, as the sun goes past it, right? Because the light will be coming from the stars into our eyes. And then as the sun goes in front, it'll curve a little bit. And so our eyes will think that the the, light was over there. There's the proof. Yeah, but there's a problem. And that's that. The sun is very bright, right? <laughs> I mean, it's like being, it's like, imagine sitting in a car, it's 
nighttime and you get pulled over by the cops and they do that annoying thing with their giant flashlight where they shine the flashlight in your eyes. You can't see the stars because there's a giant blinding thing in your eyes, right? right. Um, so that's what we're talking about here. All we want to see <laughs> stars behind the sun. Yeah. And it's yeah. like, you know, when you can see the stars, not coincidentally, is when the sun is on the other side of the planet, right? right? It's called nighttime. Right. So what is a situation in which you can see right next to the sun but the sun itself is blocked out. Well, an eclipse. An eclipse, right? And so shortly after, Relativity's published 1915. This was maybe like 1920, it's like only like five years later. There, um, it was okay, there's going to be a total solar eclipse, and I think it was in Africa somewhere. Um, I think it might have been like South Africa. Uh, and this guy Eddington, who was following Einstein, was like, we got to this is our opportunity to like see that like we can look at the sky the night sky when the sun's not there and r record all the positions of stars and then we could wait for a solar eclipse and look at the night sky right next to the sun then and that the stars should sort of be kind of pushed out a little bit because their light got bent in and so our eyes sort of follow them outwards and if you look at the sky before and the sky after it should be the same image only slightly slightly different this is an extremely hard experiment because atmospheric conditions alone, Absolutely. they already bend the path of the light even more Got than it. the sun would. Oh, really? It's a, it's a bigger effect. And so you can't, wow. you can't just look at a picture and a picture. You need to statistically okay. look at the variation in positions of all the stars <laughs> okay. and notice that the statistical average is sort of like off a little bit. So okay. it's a very hard experiment, but they proved it, that, that it was true. Um, that like light actually does bend in space time. Um, but it took that event to happen to be able to notice that. Like yeah, nowadays we have the measurement technology that like, and we also can see very far now, and so we could see whole galaxies bending light and creating things called gravitational lenses. Okay. Um, and so okay. like nowadays there's a lot of evidence for general relativity. Okay. I mean the not only does it bend space right, which is this light thing, it also bends time. And we are very good at measuring time very accurately. Um, and so you can take a, the best, the world's best atomic clocks and you could put it right here and you could look at it ticking and then you could put it like 100 meters up and look at it ticking and be like, yep, space time is curved because uh, it actually is, it's ticking at a different rate. Um, and same thing with like putting it in a plane, right? You take it, a, exactly, it's gonna, yeah. it's, it goes forward or backwards, just a little slight bit. Yeah. So. This is super important for GPS, for example, right? I think we might have talked about this in a previous episode mm -hmm. where the way GPS works, the way that satellites know how far away you are is they basically shine a, a radio laser at you and then they look at their watch and they say like, <laughs> okay, light travels, uh, you know, about 186,000 miles per second. It took like, <laughs> you know, half a second for that light ray to get to you. So you're about 90,000 miles away. You know what I mean? Like yep. that's how they do it. Yep. Um, but if you want to be able, light travels a foot per nanosecond. Okay. So if you want to be accurate in GPS to within 10 feet, which is the difference between on 376 and on Grand Avenue it's or whatever, amazing. like if you want to be able to like actually tell whether you're on the parkway or whether you're on the boulevard of the allies, mm -hmm. you need to be accurate to within the 10, 20 feet. Absolutely. And 10, 20 feet means 10 to 20 nanoseconds for light travel time and so you need to be able to measure time to within 10 to 20 nanoseconds of accuracy if you want to be able to measure distance between 10 to 20 feet using light this is the same with wow. self-driving cars right how do they work same stupid principle they shine let's call lidar right um light distancing uh and range right l-i-d-a-r and it shines a light it hits a thing the light comes back it looks at its watch and says that stop sign is like eight feet away so i should probably start applying the brakes now right um you need to be able to measure time very accurately to do that and if you didn't know that space time was curved that time was ticking differently you couldn't do it then you wouldn't be able to do you it couldn't do it um and so GP, your phone requires its knowledge of general relativity in order to actually locate you correctly. Um, so people, wow. so people that think these ideas are just abstract, esoteric, black holes, blah blah blah. It's like no, no, no. There's like, a practical solution right there. It's basically like the Pythagorean theorem to the Babylonians mm -hmm. is the same as general relativity to us. It's mm -hmm. this weird abstract calculation you do to build pyramids, to build structures, to use GPS. Like, it's, wow, it's just the same kind of thing. Yeah. Wow. We take so much for granted. <clears throat> math's great, kids. Stay in school. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so math is really fun that way. And, um, 
math is not just like calculating. Like a lot of people think that math is like, you know, nobody gets far enough in math to realize that mm -hmm. math is not really about numbers and their sizes and solving equations and things like that. That math is more about creating a logical system the way that Euclid did, um, where he said, here are the axioms and here are the rules of inference. How do you derive theorems from that? Now, like what modern math is, mm -hmm. is it's, it's basically doing that to a whole new level. The, I alluded to it a little bit with like six times seven is not equal to seven times six. There are mathematical objects in which that's true. Okay. Um, well, one example of that are rotations. If you take a book and you rotate it about the x-axis 90 degrees than the y-axis 90 degrees, mm -hmm. that's different than taking that book and rotating it about the y-axis 90 degrees first and then the x-axis 90 degrees. Okay. If you actually took an object and you did that, you would see that you would get two different configurations of the book at the end. I get so it. rotations, if you think of them one after another as being sort of multiplied together, mm -hmm. it's a form of multiplication that you can't just reverse the order, right? And so it is non-commutative in the sense that like, you know, if we call the 90 degree rotation like X and this one Y, X times Y is not equal to Y times X. Um, and so then you have to ask yourself, okay, numbers behave at, you know, five times seven is seven times five. So what kind of object has to represent your rotation? Got it. And the answer is what's called a matrix, which is like a box of numbers. And if you multiply these boxes of numbers in different orders, it gives you different results. And so that creates a whole new system of math, Got which it. is like, what is the all of the algebra and taking the square root and like functions? Like, what does all this stuff mean if all of a sudden you can't just like switch the order of stuff. Um, and so that's kind of like what modern math is like. It's sort of inventing new rules and seeing what the sort of consequence of all these new is, rules. Is math still evolving? Oh, yeah. Like right now, I mean, yeah, I think that's that's hard to, for the average person to comprehend too. Yeah. Like, the, like the rules, I guess what you're trying to convey here, if, I, if I'm reading you correctly, is that math is part finite, but also part non-finite yeah i don't think we're ever going to get to the end of math in a sense like you can always sort of make up a new thing um will give me an example of like the last 10 years something in math that you can't explain to me that was made up that we, is being used either in space technology or physics or so the sort of like i would say one of the there are many frontiers of mathematics one of the frontiers is in a, in a subject called category theory. Okay. Um, and if you just do a simple Google search of category theory, it would give you something that seems kind of like trivial. It's just basically a category theory. You have these things called objects and you have these things called morphisms, which are just arrows connecting the objects. It okay. almost just looks like a graph. Um, but what people realize is that many different branches of math, when completely abstracted, look ex they, they they look exactly the same that you think you're doing something with vector spaces and mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. you know with, with like plane geometry and then you realize that this theorem has an analog in topology which is like the theory of like objects with holes and you know continuous deformations so these two things should have nothing to do with each other, but if you represent them in this body of math called category theory, they're actually just different representations of the same idea. And so that's okay. something that's like totally bizarre and wild. Um, and if you read like a modern theory, a modern thing on category theory or um, topos theory is another mm -hmm. really big one, it would be completely incomprehensible. <laughs> to, to me, it would be incomprehensible <laughs> as well. Um, and so, so yeah, so that that's math has the impression of like we kind of are done with it it's not really evolving and that's because even if you get a engineering degree mm -hmm. like from MIT you will not use any math that was like after like the 1800s or something <laughs> like oh really yeah that like most of like modern math pretty much unless you were a math major you wouldn't really use that's not to say that there aren't like ideas in math and simplifications and languages and descriptions that didn't get better over time. Um, for example, like just the notion of a vector, which is mm -hmm. used all the time in physics and mm -hmm. engineering. It's basically just an arrow. It denotes a magnitude, which is the length, and then a direction, which mm -hmm. is what direction it's pointing. It's kind of like a more complicated number. A number is just sort of like a distance along a number line, but an arrow says, what if you can go whichever direction you want yeah. <laughs> and then go that distance, yeah. right? That's a vector. Vectors were not things people used before, like, 
1890 or something like that. Oh, so really? they're somewhat new, but the idea of what a vector is is goes back like I mean Newton Got was it. 1666 and he clearly mm-hmm. was able to do physics, right? Mm-hmm. And so so what I mean is that like the kind of math that engineers use is written a bit differently, the descriptive language is a little different, but it's essentially the same math that existed in like 1750 or something okay. like that, right? Um, even like the imaginary numbers that electrical engineers use were things that were invented in like the 1600s and stuff like that. Wow. So, so when I'm talking about like 19th century math, 20th century math, um, that sort of stuff is like, whew, it's like way on like the, the cutting edge. And they're like in this world of abstraction that is so even hard to like, what's interesting is it's like, it's getting more trivial like it's getting simpler and simpler to talk about, but it's getting harder and harder to see what's useful about it and what's interesting about it. Um, you have to like kind of have a completely zoomed out view of all of math to be able to see this Got new it. meta math Got that it. is sort of connecting this like terrain of math. It's like really bizarre. Um, so yeah, so pe- there, there are people who are mathematicians today. My father-in-law is an algebraic geometer. <laughs> he works in these projective complex spaces um, and complexes and like imaginary numbers, yeah. not like difficult. Yeah. Um, and and yeah, that's why he just sits at most of his day. He pretty much eats nothing but like bread and water and he just sits in like a chair with like a notebook and a pencil and he just kind of stares off into space and slowly falls asleep for hours at a time um but he's just like c- coming up with these like brilliant ideas That's in algebraic insane. geometry so like they're definitely our thing um they're it's a thing that people do still yeah it's kind of crazy <laughs> can we talk about infinity <clears throat> <clears throat> sure I could try yeah it out. yeah the because I think there's so much um, either fascination or people throw their hands up and they just say oh that's too deep I don't want to discuss it to me I have tried to dive in uh, as a layman on the concept with so much material that I'm a little confused now too Mm -hmm. because you there's different theories of infinity right as to describing what it is Mm. Um, I got into a wormhole recently Coop where they were talking about how many numbers are within um, zero and one on a ruler? Like how many spaces in between there? And, and that theoretically is infinite. Mm-hmm. I mean, infinite, infinite can mean a lot of different things. Right. And it, the word infinite is often different than the word infinity. Yes. Yeah. So one one of the services that 19th century mathematics did for us was help articulate what we could mean by this question of what is infinity because infinity was not a mathematical idea really before the 19th century like like math- what do you mean what do you mean mathematicians said it a lot like euclid's postulate was about the line never meeting yeah you know infinitely far away but it, it wasn't like you know are, are there more even numbers or are there more whole numbers? Right. Like, there was no such thing as an answer to that question before. It's like, how many even numbers are there? Two, four, six, eight, nine, infinite. How many whole numbers are there? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, infinite. Right. And intuitively, you'd right. say to yourself, well, the whole numbers are all the even numbers plus the odd numbers, so there must be more of them, right? Okay. But there was no real way to to measure like this infinite amount or say it turns out it's the same there's the same number of even numbers as there are <laughs> and there's a mathematical meaning to this okay so this gets into <clears throat> um this guy i guess georg would be what they say he's german but george basically Cantor, uh c-a-n-t-o-r mm-hmm. that name. yeah and he was sort of the one of the first people to like really like pin down what we could mean by infinite um, and measuring infinities and how many numbers there are and what infinities are bigger than other infinities and things like that. And his idea was the following thing. He said, okay, okay. if you have sort of like a finite amount of things, what is what, what do you mean when you say that you have the same number of things? Number already is an abstract kind of idea. It's intuitive to us now because we've been counting since we were kids. But there are many cultures that don't have this idea that they can they know what one is, they know what not one is and two is, but they don't really go any higher than that. Like really? If, yeah. If you give them like a pile of stuff and you say how many things are there, they have no no linguistic element they, to they tell count. you how many. Yeah. They say like there are many things. That's fascinating. And then you'd be like, are there more things in this pile or that pile? And they'd be like, there are many in both. <laughs> like this one is bigger. Like they could like say that sort of thing. But they you could, mean on the earth today? On the earth today, there are cultures that like still do not have 
notions of counting and numbers. That was like a higher order thing that we like came up with that is very ingrained in our culture today, but is not in any way like intuitive. Okay. Um, so anyways. Doesn't that make currency and all that difficult? Oh, they don't have currency. We're talking about like, very you know, tri- like Amazonian Got tribes or, or maybe okay. Pap- Papua New Guinea. I'm not exactly sure. Um, but so one thing you would ask yourself, so this is actually a good segue into this infinity thing. In principle, if you didn't have the notion of counting and I gave you some coins over here and the same coins over here but a different amount of them how would you tell me that you had more in one than the other what would visually. you visually so visually good if there's five here and six here you could probably do it but what if there's a hundred here and a hundred and two in this one how would you do it right let's well, say i mean i would spread them out and look at them but okay. I, would, I wouldn't have a way of describing the numerical increase right so spread them out is a really key insight here what you're kind of telling me is that you would say, okay, let's take one from each. Okay. Another oh, one. Match them up. Right. You match to them see up. see which is great. And then which all of a sudden, left over. you get to the point that got you've it. got like four over here, three over got here. Got it. Got so it. this was sort of Cantor's idea, which is it, for a finite quantity, to say that you have the same amount of two things is to say you can pair them in a sense. Got it. That like, you know, three, you know, a chair, a dog, and a house looks very different than a red light a yellow light and a green light on like a, but somehow i know that they both represent the same quantity even though the lights are small and the house is giant like in what sense are they the same quantity they're the same quantity i can denote a concept of three to both of them because i can kind of pair the red with the house and got the, it you know what i mean got it and so then Cantor said so in this way the number the whole numbers one, two, three, four, five, the counting numbers are the same as the even numbers in quantity. Mm-hmm. And the reason is the following thing. Um, you take one, you match it to two, you take two, you match it to four, you take three, you match it to six, you take four, you match it to eight, and all of a sudden, yes, the even numbers are getting away from us, but there's infinitely many of them out there. Got so it. you'll never run out. Got and it. so if you can come up with a way to pair each of these things together, in that sense, we say that there is the same quantity. Got it. Right? Um, And then Cantor asks the question, are there infinities that are bigger than this naive infinity of one, two, three, four, five forever, right? Um, Are there infinities where you can't just match up one with this, two with this, three with that? And the number of numbers in between zero and one on a ruler are one of those infinities. Got it. And he wrote proofs as to why you can't just do that, why you can't what he calls enumerate the real numbers, meaning here's the first real number, here's the second real number, here's the third, and so on. Right? You can't write them, you can't pair them up with the numbers one, two, three, four, five, six. Because they keep getting split. Mm. Yeah, so, but it's it's complicated. Okay. um, Because... For example, between z- so we should talk about the different kinds of numbers. Yes, because I'm going to use Let's like some language here Got that it. I want to make sure everybody knows. Got it. So there are um, what are called like the natural numbers, and we'll include zero in this too. So mm-hmm. zero, one, two, three, four. Thanks five, to the Indians, right? Yeah, thanks, thanks <laughs> to Indians. Thank you. Um, so that's sort of like. The, that the, one through infinity, that was sort of the first thing we came up with. Is that an integer? Like, so we're going to get to that. Okay. That's a bigger group. So, okay. so far, so far we have sort of counting. And then with, with, with India, we now have zero too. Okay. Right? Um, and, and I'm sure historians that are listening might be like, well, technically <laughs> uh, the Indo-Europeans came down from, okay, I don't know. I have no idea. Anyway, zero was added at some point, right? So you have these like counting numbers. And then we wanted, because of algebra, okay. to be able to have like opposite numbers. Remember, algebra was for balancing books right, originally. Right. And so debts and things like that. Yep. So then we need negative numbers. Yeah. So we just say, okay, so for each number, zero, negative zero will be the same as itself. It, we won't get a new mm-hmm. thing, zero. Mm-hmm. But for every number, like four, we need something we can add to four to get rid of it, to turn it into zero. And so we'll call that thing negative four, right? It's the thing that pairs up with four to make zero. 11, negative 11, and so on. Those are called the integers. Got it. So the integers are all these things, right? Got it. Um, and then you could say, well, that is great for addition where you can kind of like cancel things and stuff like that. But what if I have something like five times a quantity, like X call it, is equal to 12? Mm-hmm. And I want to figure out what that quantity is. Okay. All right. I can't just add something to, you know, 12 to figure it out. What I have to do is I have to multiply this five to get rid of it, to make it into a one, because 
one times that quantity is just the quantity itself. Right. So what is the opposite of five with respect to multiplication, not with respect to addition? Five plus negative five is zero. Five times what is equal to just one, which is something that doesn't do anything when you multiply by it. And so the answer is they just call that thing one fifth, right? Got it. Right. So now all of a sudden we have fractions, right. we have ratios, and thus we have what are called the rational numbers, just from the word ratio, Got not it. like rational. It's coming back to me now. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so I think it's like the two thirds, four fifths, stuff yeah. like that. Yeah. So between zero and one, there are an infinite, infinite number of rational numbers. Got it. But that is not a bigger infinity than just the counting numbers. You can, in fact, come up with a way of pairing all of the rational numbers between zero and one with one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and so on. Um, okay. 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 So then you might ask, well, what other numbers are there in between zero and one? Well, um, the square root of two uh, minus one, <laughs> for example. Okay. Because square root of two is bigger than one, so I had mm -hmm. to make right. So the square root of two is somewhere between one and two, because one squared is one, two squared is four, so it's mm -hmm. in between there. So if you subtract one, you get something between zero and one. It's point four one four one blah blah blah. It goes on. Um, so that number, actually, this was proved in ancient Greece. Okay. Is not a divided by b for any a and for any b. It is not rational. Ah. There is no ratio which represents this number, the square root of two, or the square Got root it. of two minus one. This number we'll then call irrational in the Got sense it. that it's not like dumb. Right, it's like so, it's not a ratio. Really back now it's coming back. So there are rational numbers between zero and one. There are irrational numbers between Got zero it. and one. There are an infinite number of rational numbers between zero and one. Between any two numbers. In between zero and one, you can always find a rational number. Mm -hmm. Between any two numbers, no matter how close together on your roller, you mm -hmm. can always find an irrational, irrational number. So intuitively, you might say, well, then there must be the same amount of irrational numbers, right? Because given any two rationals, I can find an irrational. Given any two irrationals, I can always find a rational. Mm -hmm. So there must be the same, right? Um, in a sense, they're almost like they're alternating. Like if you could, like it's it kind of enough, way. right? Um, false. The irrational numbers are a higher level of infinity than the rational numbers. A higher that level of infinity. You cannot, what does that mean? So what it means, so this is what's great about mathematicians, is they'll tell you what it means, right? Okay. That what they came up with a word for it, it's called the cardinality of the infinity. It's a higher cardinality. Okay. And what it means is that you cannot do this game where you take an irrational number, mm -hmm. assign it to one, another irrational number assigned it to two and so on, you will not exhaust all of the irrational numbers by playing this game. Okay. The same way that you would exhaust all of the rational numbers by playing this game. And that's finite then. So so by but it's that you're the list that you're exhausting is an infinitely long list. So it's still infinite. The, right? It's okay. one, two, three, four. So what I mean by that is like the same way that like the even numbers aren't finite. There's still an infinite number. Right. Of them. I just mean that I can take one and put it to two, two Got and put it. it to four. Got four, it. Right? So you could take a rational and put it to one, a rational number, put it to two, and so on, and do that, and mm -hmm. you would get all the rational numbers between zero and one. Mm -hmm. But you can't do that with irrational numbers. There's okay. no way to sort of, even in an infinite list, you cannot list all of the irrational numbers. They are a higher cardinality. Okay. Infinity. There's there's infinitely more of them. In a probability sense, what that means is that if you had a line and you threw an infinitely sharp dart at the line, right. you would never hit a rational number. With a hundred percent probability, even though there are an infinite number of rational numbers, even though between any two points you would find a rational number. There are so many more irrational numbers that with 100% probability, if you threw a dart at a line, you would hit and an irrational proven number. And they that by this mathematics. Is a, this is a mathematically proven fact. So this is where like mathematicians took infinity and they actually like came up with a theory of infinity and okay. a way to understand this. Um, so here's something... <laughs> says him. <laughs> so here's something that totally... I just, it blows my mind. Okay. I just learned about this okay. maybe a year ago. Um, and I have been arguing about this with, with two of my friends. One, he works, um, he simulates black hole, black hole mergers. He, he works for, um, the 
basically University of Maryland and the Goddard Space Center. Okay. He's like, he, 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 he did his physics PhD with me in New York, and then he went and he does like simulations of like very heavy objects in, right. in general relativity. All right. um, and then the other friend of mine is this totally eccentric dude who was a math art double major, did a non-commutative geometry masters, and then left math altogether to become a painter, and now he makes music in Oregon. But he's also this like brilliant mathematical mind who's just kind of a crazy artist. Art um, and math together. Oh yeah, yeah, that's something. Um, and so, so he, he so, so me and, and and the G and the general relativity guy and the art math guy, we've been just arguing about like numbers okay. for for the last okay. like two months. So it's great timing um, <laughs> because we learned the following fact. So. Um, Turing, who you may have heard of, yeah. uh, Alan Turing. Yeah, uh, he that's more modern. I agree. That, that's in like we're talking 1935 yeah. was when he wrote his his big paper right. um, on what are called Turing machines, which was basically he was trying to prove things about math, but he wanted to do it algorithmically. Okay. So before computers really existed, he kind of invented the idea of a computer trying to do something. All right. Um, And it was was a theoretical computer, a Turing machine. And he described its rules and how it worked and everything. And he proved one of the biggest unsolved questions in math at the time using his idea of Turing machines, which is where, how he became famous. Um, So anyways, Turing, this paper, this 1935 paper in which he invents Turing machines is not called, hey guys, I invented the modern computer. I invented Turing machines. It was called, um, on computable numbers and its applications to the Entscheidung's problem. So forget the second half. Okay. The first half is on computable numbers. So uncomputable. On, like, a, oh, like, on like talking about numbers. computable numbers. Okay. So, okay. Okay. So we talked about rationals, we talked about irrationals. What is a computable number? What does this mean? So a computable number is literally a number that you can say how to compute it in a finite way. That's okay. kind of like the easiest, like, okay. like, there's more technicalities there. But so, the, so pi, for example, mm-hmm. is not a rational number. There are no two numbers. You could do one over the other one. If there were, we wouldn't be making such a big deal about it. We'd right. say, what is pi? Pi is 22 over 7. Get over it, right? It's close to 22 over 7, but it's, it's not, not quite. quite that, right? Um, but I can write down a finite algorithm, which tells you how to compute all the digits of pi. Okay. Okay. So it's nice in the sense that if you wanted to know what the trillionth digit of pi was, I could hand you a note card, and it would tell you how to find the trillionth digit Got of pi. Got it. Got it. Computable numbers are the same amount of infinity as the even numbers. That you can match up one, two, three. You can match up numbers I with get it. every computable number. So computable numbers include all of the rational numbers, mm-hmm. right? Six over five, mm-hmm. nine over t- ten, whatever. And they include every irrational number that you've ever heard of in your entire life. And yet those are as as frequent as many as just like even numbers or odd numbers, right? Right, it would seem to be. So what that... Logic would tell you that. Yeah, so what that means is that most numbers in like a very pres- mathematically precise way, meaning if I throw a dart at the number line, I will with 100% certainty hit one of these numbers... All of those numbers are numbers that you cannot even describe in a sort of finite way, a way to calculate the digits of, right? Um, and so what that means is all, all, almost all of numbers in like a probability sense are numbers that we've never heard of, that we don't even, that we can't even with a, with a Turing machine, with a human description, say how to calculate. All of those numbers are numbers that you can abstractly say, like this number is the solution to this kind of problem, but you can't say this is the way you would plug into a computer how to calculate the hundredth digit of this number. Okay. So so why why I got interested in this, what started all of this like rabbit hole for me was um, a sort of mentor and uh, old professor of mine from undergraduate. He's a professor emeritus now at Pitt, uh, Tony Duncan. He was a Weinberg's student back in the day. He was like a particle physicist. Wow. Um, but he started getting into Turing because it kind of dawned on him that like what physics is trying to do is compute numbers. It's mm-hmm. trying to like mm-hmm. figure out what like is there a theory which will compute the mass of the electron or something like right. that, right? That's like right. the idea. Right. Um, however, mathematics has showed us that if there are just like 
constants of nature mm -hmm. out there mm -hmm. in the universe mm -hmm. and that they are just sort of randomly chosen from the number line with probability zero will we be able to compute those numbers because all essentially all numbers are numbers that you cannot compute by definition okay so this is like a totally this okay. thing is like a, and so yeah so then me and my friends like we got into this long <laughs> argument and had to have like a three hour zoom call with each other the other day um about sort of like so should we even be doing math with things we can't compute like should maybe math just be about computable numbers but if that's the case then what the heck is the number line? Um, and it turns out that you do break a lot of math if you throw out all of the non-computable numbers. That compute non-computable numbers mm -hmm. sort of like make the number line continuous in like a Got very it. sort I, of I precise that. sense. That com that the computable numbers, while infinite and infinitely dense, are still infinitely full of holes, which makes certain theorems about calculus and sequences and things like that kind of messed up like it allows you to go from below the x-axis to above the x-axis on a straight line without touching the x-axis this is called the intermediate value mm -hmm. theorem like mm -hmm. it's a big problem if you don't have that um so anyways that's what's going on that that would be sort of like a little snippet on like how to mathematicians think about infinity which is just one way to talk about this linguistic thing infinity there are many other sort of ideas that you might there are many directions that a non-mathematician would go if you ask them about infinity but mathematicians they tried to nail down what you could possibly mean by this concept um and this is sort of like what they've come up with this is the idea of like what does it mean to be a quantity of anything comparing things um they think of infinity as a very sort of kind of mechanical algorithmic thing, mm -hmm. like saying that like the the phrase the natural numbers are infinite is basically a shorter way of saying if you give me any natural number, I can always find another natural number that is bigger than the natural Got number it. that you've given me. You know what I mean? Like which, which proves infinity well, for that sense. I would say that these are actually the same sentence to a mathematician. Okay. But a mathematician uses the word infinity to mean the following process. I get it. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. so that's by all means. Like when people on the street say infinity, they don't necessarily mean that process or this sort of weird bijection thing of comparing numbers. Well, people think non-measurable. There's like infinite amount there's just a, a number that's on, like you know we hear the universe is an infinite there's a theory the universe is infinite uh you know it just that's a it's a whole other rabbit hole of course but yeah it's not an in the sense that it's this we should think of it more as the sentence it's not a number mm -hmm. it's a sort of process it's an idea it's this notion that you can't get to the end of the universe. Do you know what I mean? Like to mm -hmm. say the universe is infinite, it's not saying that the universe is this specific size and the size is infinite. Right. It's saying that there is no way to get, that if you define size as I go to one end of the universe and the other end of the universe and see how many rulers I have. Right, if it's measurable in that sense, that if it's infinite, then you just can't do that activity. It's not that you have an infinite number of roller sticks. It's that that activity is not possible because there is no end of the universe. Do you know what I mean? So we shouldn't be thinking of it as a number. We should be thinking of it as a sort of negation to an assumption you made in the first place, which was that you can get to one end and then get to the other end and then put measuring, put rulers next to each other. Is there any conventional wisdom today in the year 2021 in science? Or, or, or is it just still varying theories? But is there... A some kind of consensus in regards to the universe oh, and, yeah. and if, in infinite nature. Are, are we there yet where we think it's in, it's not measurable? Yeah, so this gets into it because people often talk about the size of the universe. And even earlier today, I talked about the number of mm -hmm. stars and it, like, what is, how could I say that sort of thing? Like, um, so what we mean by the size of the universe um, has to do with the observable universe. Right, you hear right? that word. You do in hear there. that, right? And that's a very important caveat because, like, we there's no we don't know what the size of the universe is. All we know is that things seem to be receding away from us, like on large mm -hmm. scales, right? Andromeda Galaxy is actually coming towards the Milky Way galaxy, but if you go like millions of light years past that, if you look at really big scales, probably you have to get to like a billion light years before this starts to be true. Um, everything is sort of receding away from everything else. Furthermore, mm -hmm. that receding—that was Kepler, right? Oh no, this is uh, this is 
basically Hubble oh, in I'm like sorry. 19 yeah, something. The yeah. Hubble, yeah, he exactly. was seeing the galaxies are moving away from yeah. us at a faster and faster rate. S- yes. So, yeah, so we'll get, there's a, okay. there's a slight setup. We'll get, so basically, um, if you look at galaxies, they're mm-hmm. moving away from us. And the faster and faster rate thing that you're talking about has to do with if it's further away, then it's going even faster. Faster, right. Um, and this okay. is, there is a phenomenon where this happens all the time, which is if you take a balloon mm-hmm. and you take a marker and you draw, you know, three dots on the balloon, when you start blowing up the balloon, the dots start getting away from each other, yeah. right? None of the dots are really moving, but they're all receding away from each other. Is that a cause of inflation? So, so that, that? that's because, in a sense, your space is inflating, inflating right? Okay. It's getting bigger. Now, if you start, were at the first dot, if you looked at the second dot, it would be moving away from you at a certain speed. And the third dot would actually be moving away from you at a faster, faster speed. speed. And this is like if you were an ant living on a balloon that was expanding, this is an experimentally true fact that Got you could it. do, right? Got it. It turns out that under inflation, the rate at which things are moving away from you is simply directly proportional to how far away it is. Got it. If you're twice as far away, you're going to be receding twice as fast. And, that, and that's what Hubble, is, Hubble discovered. So right? what Hubble discovered is that this very simple fact about ants and balloons also seems to be true of the universe. Okay. That basically things twice as far away are going twice as Got fast. Got it. Um, okay. Okay. Attributing this thing directly to Hubble's original discovery, how did he know the actual distances? It took us a while to sort all that out. But what he noticed is that things seem to be redshifted, which using the Doppler effect Mm -hmm. tells you that they're actually going Mm -hmm. faster away from you. Okay, anyways. So the universe seems to be going like this. And then the subtlety that I wanted to kind of point out is that it's going like this faster and faster that it's actually accelerating in the rate that it's being blown up have we so, measured the speed um so this is yes um there is this sort of yes this is kind of called the hubble constant in a sense okay which is related in the balloon analogy to how, how hard are you blowing into the balloon what seems to be happening is you know whatever the cosmic blower is in our universe that mm-hmm. is blowing into the mm-hmm. balloon they seem to be blowing harder and harder. Okay. Which is kind of the opposite of what you would expect. That what you would expect is that the blowing would get weaker and weaker. And the reason is is because okay, things expanded and you know in the right. sort of big bang moment, but they also are all pulling on each other. And so you would expect them all to sort of contract. Contraction, again. right. And so we're we, not at that point yet. We though. might not be at that point. <laughs> okay. And so for that reason, but what we would expect is like, yes, we're still expanding, but the expansion should at least be slowing down. It's right? not. But it seems to not only be not slowing down, it seems to be speeding up. But not yet, though. As if May- something... Well, that's... Well, we're we trying to predict it. Yeah, we don't know. We don't know. what The cosmological constant, like... Well, what is that? The this definition. Is, this is a term that mm-hmm. you put in Einstein's theory of general relativity that reproduces this accelerated expansion, right? It's literally just a mathematical thing. Mm-hmm. It's a constant that you put in an equation. And the what that does dynamically to your theory is it causes the acceleration of the expansion, right? So not just is it expanding, but the expansion is also accelerating. So, it, it, so I saw an example once, and maybe I'm barking up the wrong tree, but they, I think um, it wasn't Alan Guth, it was um, Leonard Susskind, famous uh, mm-hmm. theoretical physicist. He was writing the number out. I yeah. guess, or as far as we can take it, it's a very long number. Yeah. The con- the co- was it the cosmological constant? Is a long defined number, or does it have an end? So he was writing like lines of numbers. It seemed it seemed to go on forever. Right. Um, so, in in the sort of philosophical spirit of our previous conversation, yeah. Yeah. it likely does go on forever. Okay. It may not even be a computable number. <laughs> okay. <laughs> right. It's, that it's that some, might have been his point, but it, he said if one digit was removed or changed in this long, if one num- if one if a one was turned into a two, in the thirty thousandth position. position that would then change reality. Oh, yeah. So the cosmological constant, it is sort of like controlling um, the ability for matter to have enough time to cluster together into galaxies that was and it. things, right? That was um, it, yeah. Because if the number gets too big, then things just kind of blow apart, right. and then you don't get this rich dynamics universe that we have today. If it's too small, then things go, and they come back together. But they seem to be expanding, but 
the acceleration is so small that like it allows time for things to sort of come together, but it's not zero. And so the question is sort of like, why is it so small? Like what, if it was just a little bit different then it would actually affect. And so Susskind is, is, is talks a lot about the anthropic principle, which is this idea that- Yeah, I, don't, I never understood that. I've heard that so many times. I don't, I don't get it. The idea is basically that there's a lot of coincidences in the numerical value of things in nature okay. that seem like if they were any different, then the universe would not be able to create thinking beings like humans. Okay. Like in order to have humans, you need to have a chemistry rich enough in order to create molecules mm-hmm. like DNA that are like kind of like crystals in the sense that they're solid repeating patterns, but they're not completely repeating so they can contain information. Uh, they're not completely rigid like crystals so you can unzip them and copy them, but they're strong enough that they don't just dissolve whenever they're in a fluid. Like there's chemical things that make that very odd. Um, there's cosmological things like this sort of expansion of the universe that had to be tuned just right in order to have the universe live Your long fine enough. Fine tune is what you hear. Fine yeah. tuning, yeah. And so the anthropic principle is that, like, you know, this this gets into like a little bit more details of strength. I wanted to talk about the infinite universe for a second, yeah, yeah, but sure, to, to, sure, con- to sure. continue, uh, okay. to, just to finish off the anthropic principle, the idea is if you have a mechanism by which many different universe universes could be populated and like string theory and eternal Mm -hmm. inflation are ideas in which you have these like bubbles of universes that are able to pop up then it should be no surprise that a thinking being like ourselves ended up in one of those bubbles that happens to have all of these weird constants because if there weren't all those weird constants we wouldn't be there so it's kind of inverting the question Got of it. like where it's like I see it's not like why is nature the way it is it's like nature could be a lot of different ways but the nature that we experience has to be the one that sort of fits the ability for us to exist in order to, to enable this to happen it. exactly yeah so that's the anthropic principle okay. in, in a sense what makes it powerful is this idea that it, is that you need there to be many different universes in order for this to kind of work because it's it's almost like natural selection uh, through Darwinian evolution, Mm -hmm. the reason why it is such a powerful thing is because nature runs all these different experiments. It mutates the DNA to create variation in some trait. With love is based on adaptability. But not all traits are created equal. Like you said, like some traits are more adaptive than others. Right. And so those survive and the other ones die off. Got it. You might say, oh, if you know, you just needed to get from, you know, there's this moth, right, that has this like super long proboscis that it uses to get nectar at the bottom of this super deep plant, right? Mm -hmm. If you thought like, what would the probability be of this moth's DNA to create such a long nose, that probability would be extremely low. Just like what's the chances that the cosmological constant would be exactly tuned to be the way it is. It's extremely low. But the reason why when you see that moth, you're like, yeah, that makes sense, is because you know that there are many moths. And there have been many moths for billions of years. And the moths that have the long nose survive because they're able to reach the nectar in the bottom of the deep thing. And so there's a sort of cosmological Darwinian evolution going on where it's like, if you could have a situation in which many universes are being populated, which is a dynamical consequence of a lot of Mm -hmm. theories of of Mm -hmm. quantum gravity, Mm -hmm. then you would expect there to be a variety of different universes and you would expect us to be in a very peculiar one because it was able to create us (laughs) in a way. And so now with that number, essentially the number of those universes, is that even measurable? Is that infinite? This is literally a theory. It's a theory. Yeah. This is literally called the measure problem, which is to try and understand what is sort of the probability like you know we can kind of say that the size of noses of moths follows some sort of probability distribution okay. it's probably like a like a bell curve kind of thing okay. right where there's mostly the average size but it falls off as you get longer and it falls off in this way there are mathematical principles to say that it should follow a shape called a normal distribution blah 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 um but nobody knows what the distribution of universes should be, right? Mm-hmm. And so to answer mm-hmm. your question, we don't really know if there's a lot of them or there's few of them, like what that even means. What's the sort of, is it, because what we're kind of trying to answer is like, are we in a special part of the universe in a sense? And Right. And, and so it's not. Or is co- it just purely random? Or is it clearly it, random and we happen to be in the one that it allows for us to exist. It, it permitted yeah. us to exist. Yeah. Um, so anyways, back to the universe mm-hmm. is infinite sort of thing. So we know the universe is expanding because it's expanding. If you get far enough away, you're going faster than the speed of light. 
relative to us. You're not actually moving. You're a dot on a balloon, right? But if that balloon is 15 billion light years across, Got then it. eventually a point is receding away so fast because it's light can't catch it. That that literally, if they sent us a a, a signal of light. That it wouldn't reach us. It, it would be going like this towards us, but the space in between us would be expanding, and it wouldn't reach us. Um, and so that's what we call the radius of the observable universe. Is okay. basically, yes, there the universe could be infinite in the sense that I could go in this direction forever and never hit a wall. But there is a very finite nature to the universe in that at any given point, there's a finite amount of matter that could possibly affect me in a sense okay that could send me information that could that that could send that could talk to me right and so our universe is finite in that sense right it's finite in the sense that anything that we should care about that could have any physical causal influence okay. on us okay. is finite there are a number of stars that you can actually count one, two, three, mm -hmm. and you would get to the end mm -hmm. of all the stars that we could in principle see. Yeah, in our the, observable with, universe. With the most powerful, with an infinitely powerful uh, telescope, okay. we could still only see a finite number of stars. And so that, that's the sense in which the universe is finite. Now, or uh, is finite because it, it has an edge, mm -hmm. but it's not an edge that you can get to because once you move 10 feet to the right, another star might enter your observable universe. Okay. Um, so okay. this is all predicated on the idea that the universe is expanding. The cosmological constant, we don't have an actual physical theory that sort of expands predicts it we can model it right but it doesn't we don't know its nature we don't know if it's really constant um and so if all of a sudden it got smaller and smaller until it was zero and maybe even got negative or something like that then all of a sudden all these stars that were outside of our observable universe could enter our observable universe and so even saying that there is a size of the observable universe that's sort of assuming everything stays the way it is Got now. It. Got um, it. And so I kind of lied when I said there's no way they could have a causal influence on us. That's there's no way if the cosmological constant is indeed just a constant, but it could might it might not be a constant, right? It might be changing. <laughs> um, oh my God. And and you might say, well, well, okay, well, can't we just that measure? could be very dangerous if it all of a sudden just changed on a Wednesday. <laughs> it could. It could definitely change. Yeah. I mean, clearly, if it is changing, it's changing very slowly because we can measure it in different ways. Okay. Um, and this is maybe a good segue into the mm -hmm. physics today. Mm -hmm. um, there's currently a very big disagreement. By very big, I mean like pretty small numerically, but like very big in terms of our certainty that it is a disagreement um, between two ways of measuring the cosmological okay. constant. Um, and essentially, in a nutshell, one way is sort of measuring the cosmological constant like from very long ago, and another way is measuring the cosmological constant from some more recently. And these things are disagreeing, and one possible explanation of that is it's not really constant, <laughs> that, okay. that the cosmological constant is indeed changing. Many things in the universe are described by fields, and fields are dynamical objects which change in time. So we, we would kind mm -hmm. of expect the cosmological constant not to be constant, but we just don't know at what time scale does this thing change. And it right. seems like we are, even in our short 14 billion year universe, we're starting to be able to see discrepancies maybe of this thing. It's not it's not agreed upon by the scientific community, but it is something that's like starting to prop up. One of the biggest unsolved mysteries that are, that is an actual scientific disagreement is what's going on with the cosmological constant. Experimentally, theoretically, there are many d disagreements, um, and but experimentally, now we're not even sure if it's a constant. So that's a very <laughs> exciting thing that's happening. Oh my god! Yeah. The oh my gosh, there's so many ways ways to go with this. Uh, we've touched on string theory, and we touched on multiple universes in the past too. But but again, I think it just plays in that whole concept that we want to stay on infinity because uh, the many worlds theory is is that there's well, I'm probably going to stumble through this. Is that where there's an infinite amount of universes? Is that what the many worlds theory is? Okay, so this is a very common thing that people get tripped up on, and okay. so it's good to like clarify. Okay, there are two different kinds of many different universes. Okay, and sometimes they're both called many worlds, but they're both they're two different things that are very different. Two theories, two different um, theories. Yeah, they're just talking about different things. In okay, a sense. so what I was talking about before, where you have some sort of mechanism by which 
new little bubbles of universe expand in right. some like larger, more infinite bubble, and that there's some sort of cosmic inflation that's happening forever, and little bubbles inside of this inflation. Which might, nuclear, might explain our it might, existence, it, it, our universe. Exactly. It pairs well you know, in a sort of like a nice wine with the anthropic principle Got because it. then it sort of says, well, of course the cosmological constant is like this weird number because like we're here and there are many bubbles we could have been in, but we're only going to be in, in the one, one, you know, a really nice way to, to think about that more abstract thing than the bubble thing is something that a professor of mine said in New York where he said, look, let's look at the total volume of space. Okay. Right. Of, of like the observable universe absolutely huge now let's look at the total volume of space in the universe that is within a hundred kilometers of a rocky planet okay right? um the volume of space hard to even describe using numbers people are comfortable with um the volume of space next to a rocky planet is is big but it's not that big right um it's maybe a trillionth of a quadrillionth of a billionth of a percent of the universe is within 100 kilometers of a okay, rocky planet. Okay, fair enough. So why aren't people asking the question, have you noticed everyone you met is within 100 kilometers of a rocky planet? Right? Like, we could have been anywhere in the universe. It's massive, yet we all seem to be very close to the surface of a rocky planet orbiting not too far away from a medium-sized star. <clears throat> and... The answer to this is obvious. It's like, no, we couldn't have been everywhere, right? We couldn't have been in the middle of intergalactic space. We needed to be close to this thing because that's where we could survive. And so that's a sort of more mundane version of the anthropic principle. Got it. That, like, there are regions of space in which thinking people can exist. We're not even talking about consciousness and stuff. Is that what the Goldilocks and, zones are in terms of how, how far <clears throat> away from stars an yeah, Earth-like so, planet might be? Yeah, so Goldilocks zone has to do with like, you know, planet stars around uh, planets around other stars, like exoplanets. There's a certain place where you're too close, it's too hot, you're too far away, it's too cold. Too cold for what? We're talking about water being in this like liquid okay. state in particular. Okay. So yeah, so why are we in the Goldilocks zone? Like, whenever the Goldilocks zone is a very small region around a star, and the answer is just because that's the only place we could have been, right? And that's what the anthropic principle is kind of about, which is Got like, it. it's it's like if you have a mechanism by which you have a bunch of different universes, then we're going to end up being in the one that's in the Goldilocks zone of universes where it. the cosmological constant is what it is. I get it. Um, so that is one version of many worlds, which is like literally like many universes. Um, but that is different than what physicists usually mean when they say many worlds. Okay. What they usually are talking about in that specific phrasing, you know, many mm -hmm. in world, the adjective and the noun like that, what they're usually talking about is a, an interpretation of quantum mechanics. Okay. Um, Quantum mechanics has this thing that is different from classical mechanics, right. from like the normal Newtonian kind of right. physics. Um, and what it is, is that reality seems to be a lot richer mathematically than we're able to actually observe. <clears throat> that the base thing that is sort of evolving in time and reality is called the wave function. Mm -hmm. And that every time you try and observe anything, you're only getting a little snippet of the wave function. That observation itself changes it. kind of collapses this wave function into one per I get, okay <clears throat> and so what the the copenhagen interpretation so named because niels bohr was in right. copenhagen and he right. was a big uh one him and big, einstein had to battle one right. of the main they did yeah they had quite a quite a number of like philosophical debates about right. what quantum mechanics could even mean the copenhagen interpretation is essentially that there is one universe and when you observe something the universe sort of like irreversibly changes where the wave function collapses into another wave function. Um, what are the dynamics of that collapse? How long does it take? Blah, blah, blah. Nobody knows. Okay. That collapse mathematically doesn't even fall, satisfy the like axioms, the sort of principles of quantum mechanics. So a lot of people are very uncomfortable with that collapse postulate. Why? Because there's no right. mathematical logic to it? Because it seems very ad hoc, where quantum mechanics is this beautiful theory of rays and Hilbert space mm -hmm. evolving unitarily, like the mathematics is very kind of simple and succinct from the perspective for how crazy it could have been. In a sense, quantum mechanics is actually simpler than classical mechanics mathematically. Okay. Um, the geometrical object that describes 
the space of possibilities mm -hmm. in classical mechanics is a much more complicated object Interesting. than the theoretical sp like mathematical object that describes the space of possibilities in quantum mechanics. Okay. That This is called the phase space. The phase space of classical mechanics is this symplectic manifold that has all this weird structure. The phase space of quantum mechanics is a much simpler sort of like vector space kind okay. of thing. So this is getting a bit in the weeds. I but, understand. But, but, but what I'm saying is that quantum mechanics is actually a very, when we finally understood it, it's actually a very elegant, simple theory. Got it. But then you throw this thing in there, which says, when you look at something, this beautiful vector in Hilbert space just rotating around unitarily, all of a sudden, something totally out of the blue happens, where the universe like rolls the dice, mm -hmm. and then it looks at you know a number, and then it picks which of these particular now, states it wants to Give me to be theories in. as to why that's um, happening. So, well, we we don't really know. That's right. just that's how this is how they figured out how the math of quantum mechanics reproduces the experiments of quantum okay. mechanics. The math is simple and elegant, but the experiments, either whenever you like look at at your, um, so one example would be you can take. Um, silver and you can heat it up so that it starts ejecting these silver atoms mm -hmm. and silver atoms have this nice property that they kind of have a spin from their single electron in the last orbital that's either kind of up or down and you could take a magnetic field that's sort of changing in its mm -hmm. intensity past that little electron that came out of the silver atom through it. This is called the stern gerlach experiment okay. for anybody at home. And it'll either go up or down. Okay. Every time. Okay. Either it goes up or it goes down. Nothing in between. Right? And so the wave function of mm -hmm. that electron was something much more complicated but then what happened whenever the electron passed through the magnetic field is the universe said, the oh, dice. Up, it goes up Okay, this one goes up, and so it's basically flipping a coin to like figure out which way it goes. Um, now, the wave function tells us the probability of going up okay. and the probability of going down, but it doesn't tell us whether it goes up or down, right? Um, and okay. so, so this is this is just this is the quantum uncertainty. This is the Heisenberg uncertainty quantum principle. Quantum uncertainty principle. <laughs> exactly. It's a thing, right? right. It's not, I didn't. It's not my idea, right? Don't get mad at me about it. Um, and. So yeah, so basically that's really weird. So the many worlds okay. interpretation of quantum mechanics, which is different than this inflation, yeah. that stuff has to do with general relativity, yeah, often it. it takes place in string theory. The many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics basically says, no, the universe is the wave function and it's nice, beautiful evolution that mm -hmm, it goes through, mm -hmm. right? Um, that whenever us, humans like observe the silver atoms little electron that went through the magnetic mm -hmm. field what really happens is the universe contains all of those possibilities already okay and that okay. whenever we look at this thing and we see the electron of the silver atom go up there is another us that saw the electron of the silver atom goes down that there isn't one sort of unified existence that everything is in that there's one unified mathematical structure called quantum mechanics and within this structure there are many different perspectives of, of there are many worlds in a sense that are all happening well, simultaneously that's so yeah. that's kind of the idea that you know it's Sidney Coleman who's a brilliant uh, particle physicist like 60s 70s he Cut, phrase the question of like you know what if we forget the whole collapse measurement thing okay. what if we just said the universe is plain old quantum mechanics where you have the mathematical structure of quantum mechanics the evolution what would the universe look like under those circumstances and if you think long and hard enough about that question a conclusion that one could come to which I, I like this part this okay. is my conclusion as okay. well um, is that oh actually you would get all of this weird probability stuff as soon as you try and have a subsystem inside of this theory, try and construct a Sorry, a reality yeah. uh, of this theory in its observation. That the sort of weird coin flipping thing actually kind of has more to do with us than it does Got with it. the universe. Okay, and that's not to say what a lot a lot of people will take this and be like, "I knew it. Consciousness creates reality." Uh -huh. Like, well, right? I, like, I can see where the leap yeah, is. Yeah, I it's get not it. necessarily just about consciousness. It's just that like. Information-wise, quantum mechanics is more rich than this mm -hmm. sort of like mm -hmm. linear unitary reality that we're seeing. Um, that the probability comes in because you know 
This is this is one of Sean Carroll's insights, which I really mm-hmm. like. Where Sean Carroll asked the question, "Where does probability actually come from in quantum mechanics?" Um, if you don't want to believe in this collapse postulate thing, why do you get probability? Like, okay, I could see why the probabilities should be the way they are based off of the wave function, but why probabilities in the first place? Right. And his explanation is that it's really a self-locating uncertainty that leads to the probability, meaning, meaning the following thing. So. You know Schrodinger's cat, right? Mm-hmm. Schrodinger's cat, you have some quantum process that either releases a poison or doesn't. There are many quantum processes that can do this. Radioactive decay is an example of a right. quantum process that right. could that could, you know, shoot a particle, break a glass vial, it releases some poison. And so the cat is inside of the box, and if that particle releases then the cat dies. If it mm-hmm. doesn't, the cat stays alive. And so in a sense, the fate of the cat is tied into the fate of this quantum process, Got it. which before you look at it is not alive or dead, but is the quantum wave function, right? Because according to Bohr, no collapse has happened Got yet, it. right? Got it. And so this is what Schrodinger pointed out is really weird about quantum mechanics is that this isn't just about electrons mm-hmm. because the fate of a macroscopic like creature it doesn't have to be a cat, you know. He just he didn't want to be morbid, but like right. put a conscious creature like right. a child in this box, right? right. You know, um, or maybe someone who like deserves it more than a child. Put somebody yeah. in the box, right? Yeah. That could be alive or dead. Um, and if you believe quantum mechanics, you have to believe that that human is in a state of superposition between the two. Like, that's what does that nuts. mean, right? That's so that nuts. sort of thing. So like, so let's put something in the okay. box or whatever it is. Okay. And according to Bohr, you know, when I open the box and I observe the system, Mm -hmm. then the universe rolls to dice. Okay, cool. So uh, the cat is dead. (laughs) The cat is alive, right? For viewers, let's say the cat is alive. It makes it out okay, right? Um, So what Sean Carroll says is, no, 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 no. The cat is already both alive and dead, that the universe is much more rich, complicated structure than just a single unitary reality, that there's actually this more complicated mathematical object called the Hilbert space Mm -hmm. of the universe and the Mm -hmm. wave function of the universe. And what the dice that is really happening here is that when you're about to open the box, you don't know which you you are going to be. Okay, that's <laughs> right? what I want to get that to. That is the self-locating okay. uncertainty. Okay. That, like, am I going to be the coop that opens the box and sees this beautiful little furry creature? Or am I going to be the very disappointed coop who opens the box and maybe even gets a little bit of the poison myself, right? So what Sean Got Carroll it. says is un- th- that is where probability comes in, is because we are subsystems of this larger thing. and Where every possibility. Where every possibility exists, it's already Already there, and 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 it's not just made up. There there is a certain like mathematical way to describe what all of the possibilities are here, and so it's not that has to be infinite though. Well, I mean, it's infinite in the sense that there are an infinite number of numbers between zero and one, right? It's not that like numbers are completely boundless thing that you can't even begin to describe it just but there are infinite number of them right so the possibilities are infinite but in a very kind of like quantifiable way right we my god because we can quantify infinity now remember yeah Um, i I understand (laughs) yeah so so anyways that's that's where the many worlds comes in is it's sort of like your singular interpretation of reality is more something that this subsystem of nature has constructed out of the information it's exchanging it's with its random. environment. It, and it's random that we are experiencing this subset. Yes, that there are many different yous that are experiencing many different things. And what's random is that at any given moment, what you call you will happen to be the one that experienced this particular subset. Has this subset. one been yeah. the same one all through time, or are we parts of different ones to comprise the journey? So what's very kind of interesting is, like, in a sense, like, you are, like, remade at every instant of time. That's what I was getting And you at. are sort of remade with all of your memories and all these sort of things. And so it's kind of like, this is not only true about the future of, like, what will be the consequence of the box but it's also sort of like which it there's there are many different eric mechanics right and so it's like you see yourself as like a linear thing that's sort of moving along but 
any Eric McKenna would also see themselves as a sort of linear thing moving along. Yeah, and but what if my other self is having a better time at things than I am? There's a, there is a <laughs> finite probability that the other Eric McKenna is having a great time, that Spotify <laughs> just signed the other Eric McKenna. Uh, the Eric McKenna show is now uh, the number one right. most downloaded. And, Rogan, and Rogan's probably sitting yeah. in, in some small office somewhere yeah. in, in L.A., right? Rogan is actually yeah. here. He's there one you of go. your guests <laughs> that's just on, like, shooting the shit. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. So, anyways, in a very real sense, that's true. Um, and so, like, that's what quantum mechanics Okay, so say. help me yeah. understand. This, yeah. this is a big picture, mind-blowing thing. So, if I have my hand here and I get like that, all the different movements within that movement, every mic- microscopic turn is a different like reality, right? A reality is uh, the wrong word to use. <clears throat> every uh, every possibility of my movements, my speech, my everything, everything, yeah, is a static thing, and we're kind of just. M- maneuvering in there M- moving from one moment to the next to the next to the next and that and that sort of way yeah i mean so you should think of it like you're made up of a whole bunch of atoms and there's a whole bunch of atoms in this room and so there's just basically like probably there's probably something like 10 to the 29 things moving around in this room right now okay. right just like jiggling about okay and what quantum mechanics tells you is it gives you the wave function of these 10 to the 29 things okay right um and so but at every instant all 10 to the 29 things are in a specific location as it is sort of perceived by us but all right but all of those 10 to the 29 things they have their own sort of wave function and so there is a essentially infinite number of rooms in which they are in a whole bunch of different configurations. Okay. Most of these configurations look completely indistinguishable from this, right? This is sort of like the, you know, this is not in quantum mechanically this is like not even interesting. This this goes back to just statistical mechanics where if I took all the air molecules in the room and just kind of shuffled them around, you wouldn't be able to notice. Got it. That the only thing you notice in the room is like temperature, pressure, these right. like macroscopic average quantities. So quantum mechanically, that's also true. Okay. That like, but um, there are some configurations that are extremely different, right? Mm-hmm. There are some where at any instant you can just look up measure the room in the sense that you interact with it and then you find yourself you self-locate into some configuration where the atoms are in a certain place and those atoms might all be in the corner of the room got it what you might think is not a problem until you realize you can't breathe there's an extremely high pressure in the corner of the room which is what happens whenever you like shoot a fire extinguisher with a gun and all of a sudden that pressure releases into a vacuum and so for literally no reason at all, you might find yourself in a universe in which you can't breathe and there's an explosion happening in the corner of the room. The probability of that is staggeringly small. Got it. Right? And so for that reason, you don't really we don't really care about these quantum things. As a matter of fact, we didn't even notice them until we got to the point where we are looking at small enough systems that those probabilities became relevant. Okay. Right. So two questions to stem from this. Number one this is an, then naturally we have to talk about time for a second because in this circumstance am i am i correct in stating that time as we know it is different everything that's always everything in everything behind this moment and everything in front of this moment is static and we are just maneuvering in it and that, that, that's a, that gets esoteric with predetermination and all that. I don't want to go there, but I'm saying I'm trying to understand what's happening about the probability here. That would lead me to believe that all these other options are already done, already there. We just don't have it. We're yeah. not going to experience them all. Yeah. So here's this t- time is, is you're kind of hitting on like the biggest interesting question in like quantum mechanics and and, the, and this sort of trying to interpret what all this means generally. Okay. And the the issue is that this idea of it being this sort of static thing that already sort of exists, mm-hmm. this is a very general relativity type thing, right? The same way that there is over here and over there, there is before and there is later. Right. And those things are symmetrical in the sense that like space time should be thought of as one unified object. Like right. it, the future should exist just like the past exists the same way that you know 
Cleveland should exist the same way Pittsburgh should exist. They're just two different That's points. That's debatable. Yeah. <laughs> in principle, maybe it does. There's some wave function in which Cleveland exists. So, um, so yeah. So from a sort of relativist point of view, time is not special at all, really. I mean, it is a little special. Okay. I could uh, I could get into kind of mathematical that. details. I understand but that. It, but it is very much just kind of a direction I in the sense that. that there's a future and a past. Quantum mechanically, time plays a very, very different role than okay. space. And so, like, space is not even something that... Space is kind of like an emergent description in quantum, quantum mechanics. mechanics. Yeah, that, that, that I, I heard too. Yeah, in a sense, quantum mechanics is like the wave function and time, and that's it. It basically says, here's the wave function, here's what happens to the wave function over time. And that's what quantum mechanics says. Okay. You could then ask questions about, what does the wave function say about over here and over there? To, to quantum mechanics, that's the same thing as saying, like, you know, is the electron spin up or spin down? Okay. Like, those are just observables of your quantum state. There, here, up, down, those are observables. But time is how all of those observables are sort of changing, right? Um, so, in a sense, like, some people are like, we, we have to start with quantum mechanics and time, and then space has to sort of pop out of it. But to a relativist, they're, they're like, space and time are, like, on equal footing. Got it. And so, you, it. so there's a very big disagreement about how to even think about time. What's... I think another really interesting thing is if you just say, okay, this quantum mechanics stuff about like there being all the particles in the corner mm -hmm. of the room, the probabilities are so low, you can do a pretty good job just ignoring quantum mechanics altogether and just talking about classical mechanics. We did this for a very long time. Right. In the 1800s, we didn't right. know about quantum mechanics and we made machines, we made mm -hmm. steam engines. Mm -hmm. we, like we were able to do all sorts of things mm -hmm. ignoring it. So let's continue to ignore it and then realize the following thing. Classical mechanics is symmetric in time. That, okay. What that means is that if you sort of start with a given configuration of 10 to the 29 molecules mm -hmm. in this room, mm -hmm. and then you hit play, and then they do something, you could have started at the other end, right. at the very end, and you could have just reversed all of the velocities. Okay. So if things are moving this way, you just make them go the other way. And then if you hit play you'll just run backwards. You'll just run the play backwards, right? Okay. So what that means is that if you take an egg, you hold it, and you drop it, and it goes to the ground and it shatters and does that, right? Mm -hmm. You could have started with the ground with a bunch of egg on it. Have it reform. Sprinted. And then if you would have taken every single atom, this is very important, even the vibrational modes in the floor itself that resulted from this egg, and you reverse their directions so that now the confluence of vibrations of the floor smack into the bottom of the egg, throw it at itself at just the right angle such that the shells create chemical bonds to form together, you would create, the floor would just pop in a whole egg and there's nothing in the laws of physics to prevent, prevent that. that. Okay. The reason why it doesn't happen is because statistically, it's unlikely for the confluence of all of those factors to do that. Okay. So there's this weird thing about classical physics where I can play you a million videos where 500,000 of them are some uh, are just people going about their daily life forwards in time and 500,000 of them are people going about their daily lives but we just play it backwards in time and you would be able to tell which ones are forwards and which ones are backwards every single time. We can somehow tell what looks forward in time and what looks backward in time even though there's nothing in the theory that says that one is possible and one is not. And the reason is, is because statistically, the backwards in time stuff is, there seems to be a direction to time just because of probability, because like things tend, okay. you know, Wait, eggs, the arrow of time. This is the arrow of time. time is not, so that's something that's kind of weird because like something that Sean Carroll always brings up and he, I'm sure he didn't like invent this phrase, but like it's, he talks about it a lot in a lot of his podcasts and stuff um, is, and he wrote a, his first public book was on time. And so I'm bringing yeah. him up a lot for that reason yeah. is that why do we remember the past and not the future? Like that's a good question. The physics is symmetric in both directions. Right. Yet somehow our brain is able to contain information about past moments, mm -hmm. but it doesn't contain information about future moments. At the level of atoms, a bunch of things bang together to make the brain in this direction, but they could have started here and banged together and with opposite velocities and made the brain from this direction. How does the brain know which direction to remember? That's a good question. Right? And so, so this is kind of a thing where like time is very strange that like classically from like a statistical mechanics, it's very strange. 
quantum mechanically it's very strange and relativistically it's very strange okay so i have no answers for you on this question <laughs> you're saying about time that there's a lot of really deep and interesting questions about how we should think about time that are very sort of like not fleshed out and understood yet that idea of dropping the egg does that get into the theory of entropy yeah so basically the the sort of possible ways that your 10 to the 29 atoms could be in any particular visually macroscopic state is called the entropy of that state okay the entropy of a state is literally like you know how many different microscopic configurations have the same macroscopic properties and we tend to increase entropy over time because if things are happening kind of bumping into each other randomly statistically you're going to end up in states in which there were a lot of different ways to get there. Is that chaos right? theory? Um, that's a different thing that has okay. to do with differential equations. Okay. Um, so, but but entropy is uh, is yeah they, the 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 second law of thermodynamics about increasing entropy is a way to define the arrow of time. So all of these things okay. are kind of connected. Um, well, since I asked, what is chaos theory? <laughs> chaos theory um, is 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 something that is it's a bummer in the same way that the computable number thing I said earlier was a bummer, right? So okay. The computable number thing is a bummer in the sense that most numbers are not computable. Right. So if there are like constants of nature, we're never going to be able to compute them Got if it. they're just randomly chosen. Um, why is chaos theory a bummer? So. We're getting really good at predicting things using okay. math. We're, okay. we're starting to understand Newtonian physics. And we're starting to be able to sort of like, okay, some systems are really complex, but we can approximate them with simpler systems and we mm -hmm. can get approximately good behavior. Take a mass on a spring. That spring is made up of a coiled set of metallic bonds. It's so complicated, blah, blah, blah. But I could basically make a watch out of this thing. Got it without knowing anything about all those little microscopic right. differences, right? Because for certain systems, the large scale aggregate macroscopic long time frame behavior mm -hmm. is simply modeled right by another system that is that is very regular and periodic right mm -hmm. um, but eventually we realize that there are some systems that sadly um, you are it is basically hopeless to try and approximate the behavior of that system okay so what I mean by that okay. is if you have some initial conditions, which is the math term for mm -hmm. all the initial data you need to mm -hmm. make predictions about the future. Um, our theories are deterministic in the sense that they'll tell you a trillion years in the future what will happen. Okay. Right? okay. Newtonian physics is deterministic. So ignore quantum mechanics for now. We're not getting into quantum. This right. is just purely like 19th century stuff. Got right? it. Um, but what chaos theory says is that there are certain systems which are defined by, you know, interactions between mm -hmm. things um, where if you're off just a little bit on those initial conditions, okay. right? Where you tried to measure the exact location of all 10 to the 29 particles in this room, but 11 of those particles are off by, you know, a billionth of a meter. Okay. okay? Um, for a lot of systems, that wouldn't matter. All you right. would still be able to build an internal combustion engine without okay. worrying about all 10 to the 29 gas particles in your engine. However, um, for some systems, being off by that amount will exponentially destroy the usefulness of your prediction okay that on time scales that are relevant to you mm -hmm. your predictions will be completely off so this is an example of trying to predict the weather in pittsburgh <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> that, no doubt you know if you get more and more accurate data you'll be able to predict it better and better and it's like, you know, people like to complain about it, but try and take note of how often it's right. It's very easy to take mm. note of how often it's wrong, Absolutely. but it is pretty impressive. 100%. There's been times where I've been like, look at the weather. It's been Thursday and I see like, oh, it's supposed to be sunny and it's not supposed to rain again until Monday at 11 a.m. And then there's been times where it's been like Monday at like 1045, it starts to there rain. Go, and I'm right. like, what? <laughs> so we're, do we're doing pretty good, yeah. but that's because we're measuring like pretty precisely the the atmospheric conditions okay however weather is the kind of system that you will not be able to say a month from now what mm -hmm. the weather will be mm -hmm. with any certainty whatsoever mm -hmm. um and even if we measured down to like you know a cubic centimeter of atmosphere everywhere on the planet okay Within a couple of months, we'd still be way off on the weather. Um, wow. And so if we knew every single atom, of course, we would be able to measure the weather forever. If we knew every atom in the universe, we'd be able to do it. But chaos theory is about the fact that 
you don't know every atom. You have to make an approximation. Okay. You have to just say like, okay, approximately all these atoms are going to behave like this okay. in this little cubic centimeter. And then the question is, for what systems will that be good enough to, to make predictions over long time scales? And for what systems will you very quickly create things that you didn't predict at all. That's where the word chaos kind of comes in. It it, just gets chaotic, right? You can't predict the behavior. Sadly, very simple systems can be very chaotic. And so like chaos is kind of more the norm than the exception. Interesting. Um, And so what, but but there are ways to sort of try and rein it in. You can measure the rate at which things become chaotic. So for example, our solar system is technically a chaotic system. Okay. Okay. Meaning that if you tell me where all the eight planets of the solar system, there's eight, Pluto is not a planet. Let's get that up front. (laughs) Eight planets of the solar system and the sun that there, you cannot measure that infinitely far into the future, right? That at some point, Mercury might just get ejected out of the solar system and be flying away into solar space. Um, However, the exponential time Mm -hmm. factor is actually several hundred million years. And so it's stable on those kind of time scales. Got it. Okay. So that's why chaos theory is actually a theory because it is able to measure the rate at which chaotic systems become chaotic. Like we can measure the weather. I could tell you what the weather is going to be like 40 minutes from now pretty well, but I can't like a year from now. I could tell you how the planets will be a year from now, but I can't a billion years from now or something like that, right? So that's kind of like where it, there's a lot of rich math around chaos theory. It does make predictions, but it's just that the nature of the predictions are sort of scale dependent and and tricky. If you run a universe simulator, um, Mm -hmm. Mercury gets ejected That'd like twenty percent cool of the time. Yeah, to see that. Yeah, so no, but like, and now I mean, sorry, a solar system simulator. And what I mean by simulator is I literally just mean you take the center of mass of the Earth and make mm-hmm. that a point. The center of mass of Mars, center of mass of Mercury. If you do that and you start with some random conditions five billion years ago and you run that. Every time you run it new, it'll give you a slightly different configuration, right? Because like your initial conditions are slightly different. Of course. Um, And in something like 20% of those, Mercury is just gone. Like the chaotic interactions between the sun and Jupiter and Mercury, just Mercury finds a path in phase space just to get ejected from the solar system. Wow. Um, And so in that sense, the solar system is chaotic that it doesn't, if it were just the earth and the sun, it is not chaotic. The Got Earth it. would just be on a Keplerian Got orbit. It. As soon as you have three things and not two, it is now chaotic. I understand. Um, so this is called the three-body problem, trying to understand like three things mutually gravitating with each other. And there is a science fiction book called The Three-Body Problem that was really famous, and it was like kind of about this in an interesting way. Um, huh. But but yeah, so that's kind of an interesting chaos. Kind of like if you, had to, if you had the third person, you have two people, they can keep a secret, but you had that third one in there, things all a, go straight. Abrupt shrink. chaos. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that is mathematically All right, fact. I'll throw another term at you, you hear quite often now. Uh, quantum field theory. Is that a newer term? Yes. Am I going down a bad rabbit hole here? <laughs> um, it's, uh, it's kind of a tricky one. I've, this is definitely, it is the current, like, best description we have of the universe and so oh, like okay. it gets people bring it up a that's lot. why we're hearing it now. um yeah and so what is sort of it's got quantum in it it's got the word field in it uh-huh. what does that mean yeah, um, exactly that's yeah. where my confusion is exactly yeah the quantum i'm someone getting with the field don't right. get. so basically um first of all when a there when a mathematician says the word field they mean a different thing than when a physicist says the word field which means a different thing than when a farmer says the word field mm-hmm. so we have to pick out what we mean mm-hmm. by that so to a physicist Um, which is the only important one for this particular discussion. Um, A field is basically just saying, okay, if you have some sort of space, Mm -hmm. a field is something that has a value at every point in that space. Okay. So you could talk about the temperature field in this room. How do you measure it? You take a thermometer at every point in space and to it, you assign a number. This is called a scalar field because mm-hmm. it only has a number associated with it. You think of it as only a sense of scale at each point, 70 degrees, 71 degrees, 70.5 degrees, right? But you can imagine something more complicated. Like imagine you had a room full of particles, so many and so close together that at any point in space, there's a particle there, and that particle is going in some direction. Got it. And so there's a vector associated yeah. with that particle. Okay. It's velocity, it's speed in its direction. So you could talk about a vector field. 
meaning mm-hmm. that at every point in space, a particle is moving in some direction with some speed. And this is something that you should have intuition about because when you look at these meteorology maps and stuff, you see the airflow as being a whole bunch of little arrows that are like going in some direction. That's the, that's the velocity field of the fluid. You could have like a diagram of pipes with water flowing yeah. through it. And longer arrows means faster, shorter arrows means slower. So that's a velocity field. So when you say field, that's all we mean by that. Okay. We just mean that every point in space has some sort of value. Okay. Um, it gets more complicated. There's the gravitational field in which every point is associated with the gravitation, is with the strength of gravity. Okay. The electric field has to do with this electric field vector, which is a magnitude and a direction of how hard a charge would be pushed if it were put at that point. But the important thing here is that it fills but all a weight. of- weight. Is weight, there's a weight field? Like it's um, what particles weigh? In a sense, there is a density field. Okay. Which is because like weight is a macroscopic thing of like the whole thing weighs a certain amount. Density uh, is the weight in a any particle. particular region, got it. right? So then, got it, got in it, that it. sense, there's like a density okay. field of a fluid where at the top of the ocean, the density of water is a certain amount, but as you get lower and lower, the density increases mm-hmm. very slightly. Water is pretty incompressible. But if you go to the bottom of the Marianas Trench, mm-hmm. um, you know, about 10 kilometers from the surface, the density of the water there is like 4% higher than it was at the top. And so at any given point on the bottom of the trench, you would measure a different density at Mm -hmm. any given point at the top, right? Um, So yes, there's a density field. That would be kind of what that is. Um, Okay, very good. So quantum field, what do we kind of mean by that? Like the wave function already is sort of a thing that is defined at a bunch of different points in space. And it's sort of more abstract than the idea of space in the first place. Mm -hmm. I mean, Mm -hmm turning the sort of state of a quantum system into a function of positions in space already is a sort of like weird thing that shows up in like chapter six of a quantum mechanics book. Um, And that's all normal quantum mechanics. So what is quantum field theory? How's it different? Well, it's different in the following way. Um, Quantum mechanics as Heisenberg in 25, uh, described it, which didn't really get cleaned up until, you know, Dirac and people in mm-hmm. 2830, von Neumann kind of wrote down the first more modern waves talking about quantum mechanics around 1930. Um, that quantum mechanics has nothing to do with relativity. And people knew that this was a problem, mm-hmm. that like, you know, mm-hmm. uh, 1905, Einstein was like space and time need to be thought of a little differently and people in quantum mechanics were not thinking about it differently. Um, in particular, E equals MC squared was not a thing in Got the it. original quantum mechanics. Got it. Um, okay, so what quantum mechanics also seemed to have is that energy seemed to be quantized in little chunks. All right. Right. So that light should be thought of both as an electric field, but also as a as a collection of particles, okay, right. So it's kind of the field and particle duality thing is a little bit tricky. Well, that was the fo- that was the slit test, and the double all that. slit so experiment, test, yeah. Yeah, yeah, sort of in, in eighteen hundred, early eighteen hundred, eighteen oh three or so. Thomas Young, this British right. uh, optics guy, he was photon like a, experiment. Right? Yeah, so the guy I'm talking about in, in early eighteen hundred was like light is clearly a wave because right. it has this interference pattern. But then later they redid the double slit experiment with really faint light and saw that not only does the light come in these discrete chunks like particles, but also the chunks reproduce the wave like pattern. And so you have to kind of think of it as both a particle and a wave, right? Okay. Um, and so, anyways, quantum mechanics turns fields that like. Thomas Young would describe as a wave mm-hmm. into a collection of particles. It quanti- That's where quantum comes mm-hmm. from. A quantum is like a bit. It's like a it's a qu- it's a quantity of something, right? Right. And so, from a continuous field, which takes a value at every point in space, you now have like a bit of energy at a location with a particular momentum and energy. Right. Um, and so, that's what quantum mechanics is kind of doing to your theories with fields in them. Um, But there's a problem, and that's when you add relativity, that energy and mass become interchangeable. Okay. But energy is now uncertain in the same way that, like, position and momentum is uncertain in quantum mechanics. Okay. So what that means is that mass is also uncertain in a sense. Great. (laughs) With relativity, like whether you have a, like in in particles have a mass. Uh So whether there's a particle here or not is now an uncertain thing Uh, because of relativity. Before you could say, okay, maybe energy is fluctuating, but like 
particles are particles, and that's all there is to it. All right. But now, particles need to sort of pop in and out of existence now that E equals MC squared. So when you, when you marriage relativity and quantum mechanics, you need a theory which allows for particles mm. to sort of pop in and out so of is, existence. So is quantum field theory a, a unification it's effort? It's a unification of of and it's and it's Tr- I would say it's more than an effort. It's like a nice, lovely, complete theory that unifies quantum mechanics and relativity. And in a sense, it's like a sort of like the minimalist way to do that. That like given quantum mechanics and relativity, it's sort of the unique thing that has both of those. So in have they been married, or is still in theory? So they have been married. That officially special relativity is officially married with quantum mechanics. They're going on. They're like like 80th anniversary <laughs> coming up here. Well, I so, thought that they right? couldn't I thought it wasn't unified. <laughs> where it's not so there's two relativities and that's okay. where it gets confused. Uh, there okay. is special relativity E equals MC squared yeah. right you know space and time right. sort of are on equal footing and that's 1905 Einstein another guy named Einstein same guy actually 10 years later in 1915 came up with general relativity, relativity right. which is that Yes, space-time, but also space-time is not just the stage that Mm -hmm. all of these fields are defined at. Mm -hmm. It's also an actor that is, like, moving. Understood. When you quantize the electric field, you get photons. But if you quantize the gravitational field, you should also get some particle. Mm -hmm. But where does this particle move if it also is defining what we mean by the space in which things are moving. Okay. You see what I mean? Okay. So, like, like the gravitational field somehow has to simultaneously be a particle moving around in space-time and also be the space-time itself. And we don't really get how that works. Ah, right? okay. So that's that's where, never been explained to me. Right. So that's why general relativity and, and... So the definition of space-time is the crux of it, then. Yeah. So it, the better way to put it is that gravity and quantum field theory are not unified yet. Okay. 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 That there basically was gravity, New- Newtonian gravity, and then special relativity, and then quantum mechanics, mm-hmm. and then Newtonian gravity and Einstein's relativity became general relativity. Got it. Einstein's special relativity and quantum mechanics became quantum field theory, but we don't have a way of taking gravity general relativity, gravity, and quantum now, field theory. Is that what together. string theory attempted string to do? String theory is one example of a quantum field theory that also has general relativity as a prediction of the theory. That okay. string theory at large length scales looks like general relativity. Mm-hmm. So it's a way to get out of this paradox by saying what you think of as space-time is really just a sort of like it's really a sort of zoomed out picture of these fluctuating strings that represent gravitons mm-hmm. and that you can quantize space time. S- string theory is kind of interesting where string theory is just a quantum field theory. It's not something different than mm. quantum field theory okay. in a sense. It's okay. like it's basically special relativity and quantum mechanics put together. However, the dynamics of string theory mimics the dynamics of general relativity and so what we think of as gravity is kind of like just another particle doing just another thing in string theory um, so is that what is that what, was that <clears throat> the big deal when the graviton was discovered because it was a particle like gravity was considered to be a particle then yeah so the graviton was never really discovered in okay. a sense that this is we, through a theory then. yeah because it's very hard to measure gravity at that like we can our eyes are so precise are so sensitive to light Mm -hmm. that our threshold of seeing light is only like six photons or something like that like it's like we can actually see down to the level of like almost individual photons not quite that's um, pretty close with the the gravitational wave detector that we finally were able to build in like 2015 that we worked on for 50 years it needs something like 10 to the 60 gravitons in order to like actually see anything so we probably will never see a graviton now gravitons as they get to higher and higher you believe they're there though right in a sense if you if you believe in the gravitational field and you believe that quantum mechanics turns fields into particles then yes they had has to be there okay. from a sort of principle standpoint okay um but we've never really discovered a graviton because that we don't we wouldn't be able to measure it it'd be too weak okay. unless we had a graviton that was at such a high energy 
that it started to have like gravitational effects that were measurable. Mm -hmm. uh, this happens at the Planck scale. That's okay. where this Planck's uh, yeah. Planck energy, Planck time, Planck length, all that stuff is essentially, these are the energy scales, length scales, time scales at mm -hmm. which gravity becomes important even in quantum field so let's theory. Let's talk, what, just give, give a definition of what Planck is because that's a very common term that's bounced around now. Yeah. That's so a time, that's a size measurement, Planck right. basically. And it's named after a, a physicist, right? Okay, so here's the history of all that. Okay. So Max Planck, Max Planck. Famous German physicist. Right, right. He defended his PhD on Einstein's birthday, March 14th, 1879 or something like that. Wow. Right? Okay. So he is like a generation older than Einstein. Got it. Also a German guy. Him and Einstein disagreed about all kinds of stuff. Oh, I didn't know that. Um, because Einstein was more revolutionary about Planck's ideas. Planck came up with some ideas that in some sense kickstarted the quantum revolution, but okay. Planck never believed it. He got the Nobel Prize for it, but he never really believed the implications of his work. Um, Interesting. Einstein is the first one to interpret Planck in a quantum way. And so in a sense, I would kind of give Einstein the credit for inventing quantum mechanics, even though Einstein, wow, he, even though Einstein also didn't really like it. Yeah, he railed against <laughs> it, right? Yeah. yeah, he railed against the sort of ways of interpreting it and Which, like what entanglement I mean, that's, means. And that, and that led to him and Bohr having this the... This is the Bohr-Einstein okay. arguments, yeah. Um, but yeah, so anyways, Max Planck, he is trying to understand light bulbs, essentially, like glowing hot things. He's trying to understand why certain things of certain temperatures glow at certain colors. Okay. Um, this is called, the technical term is black body radiation, but the more down to earth thing is that if you have a really hot thing, it's kind of like brighter yellowish. If it's a little cooler, it's kind of a deeper red. Mm -hmm. If it's really hot, it's like a bluish color. Like all of this is quantifiable how much red there okay. is in, in, okay. in an object in color. And what's interesting is every object that's the same temperature glows the same way. Huh. So this is like a universal thing. All right. That like if you have a piece of tungsten at 4,400 degrees Kelvin and you have a piece of steel at 4,400 degrees Kelvin, mm -hmm. that the distribution of different colors that they emit will be the same. Huh, okay. okay. There are some details getting into quantum mechanics when you have like very rarefied gases mm -hmm. that have like electron orbital transitions, blah, blah, blah. But if you have like a piece of wood, a piece of metal, a, a dense gas, all of those things, if they are at the same temperature, they look the same. This is why we can look at a star and say how hot it is. Got it. Because we could be like, that star's blue. That's 20,000 degrees Kelvin. That star's red. That's about 3,000 degrees Kelvin. Your camera settings, if you're mm -hmm. a professional mm -hmm. photographer, you've seen this before, 3,000 mm -hmm. K. Like, what does oh, that yeah. mean? Like, that literally just means a White distribution. Balance. Yeah, right. Um, good, good. So, anyways, Max Planck is trying to understand that. And he is able to figure out exactly at each temperature what the distribution should look like mathematically. Okay. He does it more or less accidentally. All right. What he discovers his law of black body radiation, the famous Planck law, which introduced Planck's constant, which started quantum mechanics. Yeah. He discovered it by trying to prove something that is just completely false. He hated that this Austrian mathematical physicist named Boltzmann, Ludwig Boltzmann, mm -hmm. um, said that entropy was actually just a statistical thing. Before atoms, because this is before we knew atoms for sure existed mm -hmm. as well. Before like microscopic atoms and things like that, entropy was a part of thermodynamics. And so we thought that entropy and energy and all these things were like fundamental concepts. But Boltzmann said, no, 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 entropy is not fundamental the way that energy is. Entropy is just some sort of statistical feature that pops up in systems with many degrees of freedom. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and Eventually, we came around to knowing that's definitely true. Planck didn't like that. <clears throat> and so Planck tried to find a origin of entropy in electromagnetic phenomena. He thought the interaction between light and matter was okay. the source of the second law of thermodynamics. And so he was trying to find that. And so this is why he studied black body radiation, because it's about Got matter it. creating light. Got it. And so trying to understand light and matter, he derives this, this thing, right? Um, Planck's constant, he realizes, has dimensions that allows you to do the following thing. By dimensions, I mean it as units associated with it, like velocity is meters per second, mm -hmm. right? Planck's constant is um, kilograms meter squared per second, like okay. in terms of its units, right? Okay. It's energy times time. Um, and what he realizes is that 
we now with like Planck's with with this constant, um, with um, Einstein's mm -hmm. gravitational constant, the history is a little different. Really, he used some constants in Wien's law, which is related to Planck's law. But okay. forget it. That okay. Modern nowadays, we don't think of it this way. Nowadays, we think of it as like Planck's constant, um, the speed of light, um, uh, uh, the Newton's gravity okay. strength. <clears throat> These things can be combined to uniquely define a thing that has the units of meters all right and a thing that has the units of time and a thing that uh, in mass right so we can come up with just by combining these constants at a number got that has it. units of mass. got it okay okay <clears throat> these are Planck units the mass is in terms of it's not very big in terms of like units of everyday life it's maybe like on the order of like grams or something but in particle physics units it's 10 to the 19 gev okay. a gev is a giga electron volt that's about the a giga electron volt. yeah that's the weight of a proton basically okay so if you took if you had a particle that weighed as much as 10 to the 19 protons okay then that would have the mass of a planck mass it's pretty small okay it's pretty small <laughs> because 10 to the 23 protons is a gram uh-huh so it's, I guess it's a 10,000th of a gram. So wow. it's a 10th of a microgram is the Planck mass. So it's not a very big mass, right? Um, but it's decently big. I mean, it's like, that's like a paramecium or something probably mm -hmm. weighs that much. Mm -hmm. um, if you took a paramecium and you like condensed all of its energy into a particle, it would be like a Planck. It would be a, it. essentially a black hole. It'd be, it'd be that much energy in that small of a region. Holy shit. Um, but anyways, okay, so that's like the Planck mass. The Planck time it's maybe like 10 to the minus 43 seconds or something like that. Um, yeah, I could ask Google, but it's, <laughs> it's something very small. It's like crazy small. Planck length, like 10 to the minus 33 meters or something like wow. that. Wow. Uh, or maybe it's centimeters even. So it's incredibly tiny. Um, so Planck, so Planck length is really small. Planck time okay. is insanely small. Okay. Planck mass is more reasonable, mm -hmm. but in terms of particle physics, it's a very high energy. Mm -hmm. um, the... Large Hadron Collider, right. our biggest, most powerful particle right. accelerator, has energies on the order of like 10 TeV, which would be 10,000 GeV. 10,000 is wow. 10 to the 4, right? So 10 to the 4 GeV is the Large Hadron Collider. 10 to the 19 GeV is the Planck mass. So we're nowhere near probing the Planck scale. Wow. It is at the Planck scale that you would start to be able to measure gravitons, wow. that you would actually have to start worrying about gravity in your experiment. The Large Hadron Collider doesn't care about gravity at all. It None of its software that's making predictions of tracks of particles, gravity doesn't even exist to a particle physicist Got it. because Got it. we're not at 10 to the 19 G. Got it. Okay. Um, so that's the Planck scale. The Planck scale is just sort of, there are these, there are these constants of nature that create a scale, mm -hmm. a length scale. You could combine them in different ways. And it turns out that these units are saying something about how quantum mechanics and gravity sort of come together. And so at the Planck scale is where you need a theory of quantum gravity. Quantum field theory will break at the Planck scale. Okay. General relativity will break at the Planck scale. You need something, that scale is so small that quantum mechanics is important and so energetic that general relativity is important. Okay. And so you just need both of those things at once. And string, <laughs> string theory is a theory that makes sense at the Planck scale. It's a one thing that makes sense at the Planck scale and it reproduces general relativity mm -hmm. at long ranges, and you're able to put the standard model of particle physics into it at long ranges and long time scales and large objects as well. No, but, but string so. theory, okay, correct me if I'm wrong, there was a gentleman, Ed, and I can't remember his last name, but in the early 80s, I think he was a big... Witten. Ed Witten. Yeah, he was one of the big people to mathematically kind of put together string theory. And then he was not debunked, but he was... his. He was marginalized, right, in terms of common scientific thought? So that's probably true in like a pop science sense, mm -hmm. which is very unfortunate because mm -hmm. in the physics community, he is widely regarded as like the greatest living physicist. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, uh, he uh, is one of the only physicists who have won the Fields Medal, which is like the Nobel Prize for math. Okay. Um, so he has a permanent position at the Institute for Advanced Study, uh, which is basically where Einstein was uh, whenever mm -hmm. he was in the United States. Um, and he 
is one of the most like impactful theoretical wow. physicists okay. alive. Yeah. Okay. Um, so he's it, just not celebrated in the pop realms. Exactly. Because if you're like, what did he do? You can't say like he invented light bulbs or something like that. You Got have to it. be like, he first understood the like duality <laughs> of M theory. Like, <laughs> so, so yeah. So Ed Witten is like, every time he writes a paper, like it gets like 10,000 citations and it's like, you can make an entire career by just waiting for Ed Witten to do something and then just like once he publishes a paper spend the next like three years like trying to understand wow. it and then like writing your own sort of like little offshoot of it and there are many people who like that's their entire scientific career is just like following the crazy stuff this guy does um, so he's actually very impressive but string theory yeah it, it was sort of originally born out of an attempt to understand the strong force the nuclear mm -hmm. force mm -hmm. um, and it was people like Ed Witten and, and Green and Schwartz and some other people who realized oh actually this weird theory of the strong force has gravity inside of it already and it can do a lot more and maybe this should be a theory of everything not just a theory of the strong force and so you know since then it's been developed into this more encompassing idea where do we stand with um, it today today the problem with string theory is that it kind of predict it kind of has too much power okay <laughs> in the sense that it's very hard to predict anything with string theory because there are string theories that predict a lot of different things and there's a, no real way to choose between the different kinds of choices you can make in defining a string theory um, like what do you mean what I mean by that is that like there that like there are string theories that have 26 dimensions okay. there are string yeah, theories that have 10 dimensions. dimensions there yeah. are string theories where the cosmological constant is this there's like this this other version of many worlds, it's not the quantum mechanics one, this where there are many different universes. Mm -hmm. This is a, a the multiverse. The right? multiverse is the is the better way to talk about that. Yeah. So the multiverse is like a string theory thing where like that just naturally that pops out of string theory, this like multiverse stuff. Oh, okay, um, so what's the what's the quick and dirty on the multiverse? The quick and dirty there is basically that um, supersymmetric string theory, which is a kind super of symmetry. You need supersymmetry mm -hmm. to make string theory work mathematically, that it is very natural and makes sense and is consistent in 10 dimensions. In 10. And so what you have to ask yourself is why do we see four, right? X, Y, Z in time. In time, <laughs> yeah. Work? Time's the fourth, right? right. So what happens to the other six dimensions? Yeah. Um, string theory has mechanisms by which those six dimensions go from being big dimensions, like the X direction, which seems to go on for a very far long to time, microscopic. to being a compact direction, a direction that is actually topologically maybe like a tiny donut and not like an infinitely long line. How can you line. draw that conceptually, geometrically so someone can understand? It's impossible, right? I mean, yeah, I mean, if you just like open up Google and <laughs> you type in the phrase Kalabi Yao Manifold, okay. um, that will be one attempt. I don't know if we can get a you know zoom in for the camera here. Um, I can overlay anything. So Kalabi Yao Manifold Crystal. I can so, overlay anything. So you could overlay something like that and I could text you what this means. Okay. These are various shapes uh, that are what could mathematically be the compactified six dimensions. Um, and the different shapes, the different sort of numbers of holes and things in these shapes lead to different constants of nature. Okay. And that's where the anthropic principle kind of comes in. What shape are the other six dimensions? Mm -hmm. Well, with all these different universes, it can compactify in many different ways. Okay. Some of those ways lead to cosmological constants, some don't. Some. And so where we expect to be are in universes that have shapes that lead to the constants that allow for, uh, that allow for like humans to exist and things like that. So string theory is kind of like too powerful <laughs> in the sense that it creates a multiverse and it's not predictive the way mm -hmm. a normal science would be like people really like it when you come up with a theory like general relativity and you say go to africa during a total solar eclipse look at the stars next to the sun mm -hmm. and you will see that they will be moved to the right by this many arc seconds like that is what people want out of a theory Got what it. string theory says is like sure our theory could be possible in string theory let me tell you about 10 to the 400 <laughs> other theories that could be possible in string theory and so in that sense a lot of people like from a a sort of taste sense or like I don't mm -hmm. want to work on a theory that isn't going to be able to like predict something that I can measure um, the people that are really interested in string theory tend to be more like mathematicians and like mathematical physicists like okay. I okay. was working on things that have to do with string theory because 
I don't care if anybody observes anything that I do. I'm just having a good time. You know, right. I'm just like YOLO on the chalkboard. And so like, I like math. I like yeah. things that, and so it's a puzzle, right? It's, exactly. It's kind of a puzzle. It has a, there's an aesthetic element to it. I mean, strength theorists are kind of like mathematical poets in a lot of ways. Mm-hmm. Like it's just sort of like, if you're asking for a sort of like prediction, you're maybe even asking the wrong question. In the first okay. But that's not to say that like strength theorists don't want to eventually describe nature because they certainly when, do. But, when Alan yeah. Guth, um, came up with the inflation theory in the late seventies. Um, was the, was his work t- then handed off to string theory, or is that it's completely t- those two completely separate fields of study? Separate there. things, yeah. Okay, so when when the name Valenkin, Andre, is it Andre Valenkin? Was he a challenger to Guth in the inflation theory? That name keeps popping up too in a lot of the. Yeah, I, th- I don't know if he's a challenger or a collaborator. I actually don't know exactly the the history of the papers in the eighties. Okay. That that did that. Basically, inflation um, is a is a particular model in a subject of study called cosmology. Okay. Cosmology is the study of the universe at large scale. Right. So you're not talking about individual galaxies. You're talking about space time and a certain average density of matter, an okay. average density of radiation, an average density of dark matter if it exists, a number for the cosmological constant. Okay. Uh, if the universe is sort of symmetric. We're looking at the big Exactly, the very big, big picture. Very big. Okay. And what's awesome is that general relativity turned cosmology into a quantifiable science like cosmology before is something that you would read in like the hebrew bible or something about like the blah 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 being created like or you know any other religion has a cosmology about the beginning and the end right the universe but what general relativity says is like there are some questions that are left to religion but there are other questions that are actually now like measurable, quantifiable, falsifiable predictions mm-hmm. you can make about cosmology. Mm-hmm. Um, and so general relativity gave you a theory for cosmology. What inflation is, is it's a model of cosmology. So it's a model of space time itself and its sort of dynamics, mm-hmm. which leads to a period of very rapid stretching of space time, extremely rapid, mm-hmm. um, that eventually terminates. Um, and this termination, all of the sort of like energy from this field that is causing the universe to expand depletes into all the other fields, right. which is what the Big Bang is essentially. Mm-hmm. It's essentially that inflation field depositing all of its energy in all the other particles of the universe that we see today. That creates a lot of heat and a lot of energy, which is why the Big Bang looks like this like hot, dense state. Mm-hmm. Um, so the theory of inflation is that why do we posit this thing that happened before the Big Bang in a sense that stretched like that. The reason is, is because the universe seems to be very flat Mm -hmm. in a like geometrical sense that like the large scale structure of the universe doesn't have any sort of like areas of larger and smaller curvature in it. Um, which is very strange because generically there's no reason to expect curvature to be very close to zero everywhere. Um, this is not like the space-time curvature near a black saying, hole, but no, no, we're talking about the large-scale structure. Um, and so one way you're saying at the Big Bang, Coop, when everything flew out, you're saying it's happening linear and flat. It's not going everywhere. It's happening. No, 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 no. Yeah, okay, good. So it's not like it's two-dimensional plane flat. What I mean is that. If you're an ant on a piece of paper, mm-hmm. right? Um, if you if it's a normal piece of paper on the surface of a table, then this is a flat plane, mm-hmm. right? If you are an ant on the surface of a basketball, if it's a very large basketball, you can't tell that it's not just a piece of paper. But you're on a curve. But there are things you could do to realize that the Pythagorean theorem is slightly different for you God, I get than it. it is for the end of the paper, right? It. And that's why there are still some fools out there that think the Earth <laughs> is flat, flat, right? Because they're an ant on a very large basketball, right? I mean, the Earth is 6,000 kilometers in radius. Right. Okay, great. So, anyways, that's a two-dimensional version of curvature okay. and flatness. I understand. Try and expand your mind to a four-dimensional version, okay. which is obviously impossible okay. to do visually, but you can kind of mathematically do it. And what it turns out is the four-dimensional curvature of the universe writ large seems to be a flat four-dimensional okay. manifold. Okay. okay. If you believe that quantum mechanics sort of causes random fluctuations in the early universe, mm-hmm. you would expect there to be regions of high curvature, low curvature, etc. Yeah. 
everything seems to be kind of flat. One way that that could happen is if there were a period in which the universe expanded very rapidly because that expansion would smooth everything out. Got right? it. A crumpled up balloon. Got it. You blow it, it gets like nice and smooth, right? So that's kind of, that's that's one of the motivations. There are many other things. There's much more precise things too about how theories of inflation reproduce the right kind of correlations of over and under densities on the microwave background mm-hmm. data. Mm-hmm. Like there's there are things about inflation that are much more remarkable than even this like, but anyways, so that was kind of like, that's all within the context of general relativity. Okay. Okay. Then you could ask the question, this inflaton field, okay. which is the thing causing the inflation that eventually oscillates into all the other fields and it creates the Big Bang. What, what is this field? Like, where did it come from? What, is, do, what theories would have inflaton-like fields that have the physical properties that Got would it. lead to inflation? And the answer is string theory has all kinds of fields in it. And like I said, it's too powerful for its own good. It can easily predict a theory of inflation. Okay. What's cool about this, though, which is actually kind of exciting, is that it's not just it can create any kind of inflaton field. String theory inflatons Mm -hmm. tend to result in very specific big bangs. Um, Like what do you mean? What I mean by that is that if you look at as far back into the past as you can, you see the cosmic microwave background. Mm -hmm. Okay, You can't see further back in time than that because the universe wasn't transparent before that it was opaque and so that's like the last light that you can see going out um that that light is almost uniform but it has little over densities and under densities and hotter and colder regions and that string theory we predicted that before we were actually able to quote unquote see it am i right we accidentally saw it trying to like do stuff for the government okay Um, (laughs) Okay. and uh but basically there are certain correlations in this data that we can mm-hmm. see mm-hmm. that string theory tends to predict. Predict it, okay. And these are very hard correlations to measure, and we haven't measured them yet. There was a scandal about 10 years ago where we thought we measured them to be string theory-like, and mm-hmm. then it turned out that the experimenter kind of fudged some, some data. Because, well, it wasn't that they were trying to like trick the public, it was that they needed really accurate data of the local sort of environment of our solar system to make sure they weren't seeing just nonsense. Okay. And they went to another collaboration to be like, can we get your dust maps of like the local environment? And the other collaboration was like, yeah, sure, we'll share our dust maps and then we'll be co-authors. And then the Mm. collaboration was like, this is too big of a deal to share with you. So what they did, and this is horrible, uh, one of the worst instances of, of, of just like, BS in modern science is they went to a talk of the dust people (laughs) and got the PowerPoint slides of the preliminary data and tried to reverse engineer their data from the PowerPoint slides. They tried to steal it. (laughs) Basically, From public realm information. Um, And and what's awesome about the scientific community is within six months they had re-engineered what these people re-engineered to try and do this a guy that i worked with at nyu literally had was taking pdf printouts of powerpoint slides and trying to see how accurately you could infer data from color maps of pdf images to see if this could be the reason why they saw what they saw and what he saw is that this could easily be the reason why they saw what they saw and so now nobody believes the result of this it's called bicep 2 was the name of the experiment um anyways but now they're collaborating the Planck collaboration with the bicep collaborate like they're actually working together and so they don't make that they haven't made that mistake again but anyways this is all to say string theory does sort of predict a specific kind of inflation okay. that is in principle measurable and so it'll be very exciting if we do see this kind of microwave background correlations then that would be a strong indicator that string theory at least is on the right track that part of string theory is saying the right thing Um, it should be noted that string theory is the only theory that i know of that consistently has general relativity and quantum field theory together in a in like a consistent way what other theories are but what competes with string theory um probably the biggest competitor is loop quantum gravity um how long has that been around 
80s maybe they're both pretty oh, similar timeline okay. yeah they've both been around that's for so t- all so all the documentaries ago. i've ever watched that was never mentioned yeah luke quantum gravity is not as big of a c- community and they feel pretty salty about that <laughs> and they think that there's like yeah they like think there's a disproportionate amount of like money going into I, string theory i which, probably believe it because you don't hear about it yeah yeah and luke quantum gravity i am not an expert i did string theory stuff so i'm clearly biased um luke quantum gravity is like a really cool idea um it sort of takes general string theory takes quantum field theory as being the the sort of primal thing and general relativity as being the emergent thing out of it okay Luke quantum gravity takes general relativity as sort of the primal thing and quantum field theory as being the sort of emergent thing out of that so one is like we love einstein and we want to go with him and the other one is like einstein was super smart but he was just looking at the sort of like large scale behavior it. and it's not it's I not fundamental it. i get it and so that's sort of like maybe the two philosophical camps um both of them claim to make certain predictions about black holes and black hole mm-hmm. entropy and stuff i think string theory has been much more fruitful because Ideas that popped out of string theory have found their way into many other fields of actual physics where they do make predictions right. and things like that. Right, right, right. So like it's a it's a much kind of richer theory that way. Loop quantum gravity, that might also just be because there's twenty times more people doing string theory Got than it. loop quantum no, gravity. I get that. Loop quantum gravity, from my understanding, has a lot of arbitrary choices that you make that are not constrained by any sort of principle or mathematical right. idea that you just sort of pick. And if you pick it a certain way, you get certain things that you like. And so a lot of people kind of look at that and are like, aesthetically, that's not really my jam. Like, strength theory, there are a lot of... You, strength theory can kind of only be a certain way. Like, there's a lot of things that have to conspire in order mm-hmm. for strength theory to be consistent that seem to be conspiring. And so strength theory... It sounds like better science to it's, me. Strength theory, from, from a mathematical standpoint, it smells right. Okay. Um, we, okay. We haven't... We don't have, like, any sort of, like, way to, like, falsify or... Got it. Like... But it smells like we're on the right track, even if, um, even if it ends up being wrong in the way that it is now. Okay. What is right will probably be related to string theory in some way. Um, this okay. is something Nima Arkani Hamed, who's another guy who works with Ed Witten at the Institute of Advanced Study, and is equally as like prominent and famous in the field of theoretical physics. I was at a colloquium with him whenever he was asked, "Do you think string theory will end up being right?" Which is like a common question people ask, and he says. I think string theory is wrong, but I think whatever is right will be called string theory. And what he meant was that what is string theory is an evolving, changing sort of thing. So it's wrong as it sits today. Yeah, and that it will kind of like continuously deform into the thing that is right because it's the right idea to begin with. And we're going to go down that path until we realize that it's right. When you look at the Hadron Collider, um, that when the public looks at it, I initially thought it was in an effort to to keep breaking down the atom and keep busting it and cracking it and busting it to find, are they looking, if that's right, are we looking for the core particle? Is that oversimplifying things? But, but, But are we trying to break an atom down to the ultimate core where it can't be broken any further? I know we're looking at how things react once we break them down in the in the shaving parts of the atom off and seeing how they react. But in, in essence, will do, will there be a point where it cannot be broken down any mm-hmm. further? This is the core of what that is. Mm-hmm. Is that oversimplification? Um, <clears throat> sadly, yes, but it's fine. It's a fine simplification. It's impossible not to oversimplify something as kind of complicated as like what is the point of particle physics. What I will say is that this distinction of fundamental, which is kind of what you're asking, mm-hmm. is there a fundamental thing such that all things are made of Derived this fundamental from thing? That. Yeah. This distinction between fundamental and sort of like composite made up of fundamental bits um, philosophically feels very important. But what we're learning is that that may kind of be a red herring in a sense. Like what do you mean? Um, so what I mean by that is that you kind of introduced infinity into your question because you said it can't be broken down any further. You've put a sort of end to this process and you've made an assumption that there is an end to this process in a way. Um, And, but it's not clear that there is, and it's also not clear that we should be obsessed with trying to go further and further in a sense. Um, so here's, here's what I mean. Quantum field theory is understood today as what is called an effective field theory. So an effective field theory is a 
kind of subgenre of quantum mm-hmm. field theory. Mm-hmm. And the whole model, the standard model of particle physics, is an effective field theory. And what it means is that it's if you give me what the particles of your theory are, okay, and you tell me the symmetries that these particles obey, that's a fancy mm-hmm. math way of saying you say how they kind of bump into each other. Then effective field theory can write down on a note card the entire theory. Okay. That if you say like there's okay. this particle, this particle, this particle, and I'm going to get a bit jargony for a second. This one's SU3, this one's SU2 cross U1, this one is blah blah. Like once you tell me these things, then effective field theory is a prescription for taking that information and turning it into the universe, an entire theory of physics, right? Um, And what that doesn't say is whether this is fundamental or composite or whatever, it just says at this scale, this is what you're calling a particle and this is what you're calling how it interacts. It might be able to be broken up into something smaller, and then you'd have a new effective field theory at a, at, a, at a smaller scale. But what's great about effective field theory is that it doesn't have to care about that smaller scale. Yeah, um, and I this, understand. And so um, this is something that's really important. It doesn't answer the question. It doesn't answer the question. I'm getting, <laughs> I will get there in a moment because there's a couple ways to answer it. Okay. <clears throat> but why this is important is because physics is in some sense done. Um, like, what do you mean? And every physicist who's ever said that has been wrong, but I'm going to say it and be right this okay. time. <laughs> okay. Um, what I mean by that is in the paradigm of effective field theory, if you understand this sort of scale, there is nothing else at the longer scales okay. that matters. That this is sort of the sum result of all the smaller scales. And you don't need to know anything about the smaller scales in order to know anything about the larger okay. scales. So we under we will never learn a thing about this is my hypo this is my hypothesis and it may be incorrect, but my hypothesis is that we will never learn anything anymore about physics that is relevant to this table. Okay. Right? That we will not learn something with some crazy particle, blah, blah, blah. Like, for example, the Higgs boson. Yeah. Right? We learned in 2012, we discovered something called the Higgs boson. No carpenter needed to know about the Higgs boson. Whether the Higgs boson existed or not made no difference. Mm -hmm. Nobody building a skyscraper, nobody even building a radioactive (coughs) gamma knife medical surgery thing. Even the scale of electrons, protons, and neutrons is way beyond what we care about with the Higgs mm-hmm. boson, right? And so what I mean by that is there's more to do always. We can always go to higher energy scales. We might find new particles there. But our theory of physics, <clears throat> as it explains chemistry and things mm-hmm. like that, mm-hmm. is done. Things can combine in really complicated ways. So okay. that's not to say that we understand biology, okay. right? <clears throat> but what everything inside of biology, every atom in our body, behaves roles that we understand 100%. Um, okay, so your question about will there be like kind of an end to that. The Large Hadron Collider is trying to put a lot of energy in a small amount of space. And when you get energy, because of relativity, you get mass. Mm-hmm. And because of quantum mechanics, mm-hmm. since energy is uncertain, you get particles. You get right. different particles. Right. So quantum field theory says if you put smash things together, you'll make new stuff. So it's not about cracking open an atom and seeing what's inside of it. It's about using atoms as bombs to create regions of high enough energy mm-hmm. to create particles that so are, the particles are being cre- the new particles are being created. Being created. It's ah, not that it's okay. It's not that there's a Higgs boson inside of a proton that we're trying to get at. It's that if you take any two things and smash them together at high enough energy that couple to the Higgs boson, which everything does, fortunately, mm-hmm. then you'll make Higgs bosons. If I throw these two things together as hard as I can, it'll make Higgs bosons. What what particles, what are the particles they're starting with? Like, we never hear that. Like, was there, what kind of particle are they starting with? Uh, which one? The Large Hadron Collider? Mm-hmm. Protons. Okay. Not yeah. photons, protons. protons. Yeah. So the thing that is in the nucleus of the atom is they're 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 just basically <clears throat> um, a plasma of nuclei that are just smashing together. Hadron, mm-hmm. the word hadron mm-hmm. means um, basically three quarks stuck together. A or pro- a monster in Godzilla movies. <laughs> <laughs> That's a okay. hydra. 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 Yeah. hydra. So hadron, yeah. So so a meson is two quarks stuck together. Okay. So a pion is an example of a meson. Okay. A hadron is three or more three. together. And so a proton is two ups and a down. 
and a neutron is two downs and an up. Those are both hadrons. Okay. So the large okay. hadron collider is okay. a very large thing mm -hmm. that is colliding hadrons. So that's what's being collided. A hadron is a category of particles. The proton is one of them. So we're taking protons and busting them, we're smashing them together, yes. and then examining the particles that are left. And those part there are bits of part those particles that are created that are created yeah on, so they're created they're created by the explosion or the contact or so the way to think about quantum field theory right because what exists are fields mm -hmm. a particle is just a little quanta of this field okay and all of these fields are all on top of each other all the time okay right and so how do you make a Higgs boson? The Higgs field is here in space. There are Higgs bosons here in a sense. How do I measure them? What I need to do is I need to wiggle the Higgs field okay. very hard so that I create a quantum of Higgs field, which is what we call the Higgs You're particle. To chip a piece off right? of it. Exactly. Almost. <laughs> and so what couples, meaning what is on top of the Higgs field and causes it to move with it. A proton does that. That's okay. why protons have mass, because okay. they're interacting with the Higgs field. Okay. So if you take a proton and you wiggle it really hard, it'll start wiggling the Higgs field, Got and it. a quantum of a Higgs oscillation is a Higgs particle. So that's what we mean by we're creating a particle. They're, they're, we're just in these fields all the time. We get two things that couple to the Higgs field to be so energetic Got it. by smashing them Got together, it. and that massive amount of energy causes ripples that when you apply quantum mechanics to those ripples become particles. So can you take now can you take two of those Higgs boson particles and smash them sure. together? Yes. And then see what happens there. Yeah, absolutely. Are they um, going to do that? No. So the problem is <laughs> is that we've never seen a Higgs boson before. Okay. Because when the the Higgs ripples and it couples to literally everything else. Okay. Okay. We have an isolated. And so it. what happens is that it immediately causes other ripples it immediately causes the w boson field to ripple which okay. immediately causes and so that particle decays Got into it. other particles okay. until it gets to particles that can't decay any further that they're stable in the sense that they don't want to become more energetic so what we see we put protons in and then what we see are like protons and electrons and stuff coming out right mm. <clears throat> um a menagerie of things, but we don't see Higgs bosons. So what do I mean by we saw a Higgs boson? Yeah. What I yeah, mean yeah, is, yeah. if we look at the data, we saw all sorts of stuff crashing out of every collision. And if you look at what comes out of each collision at each different energy scale, you can measure, say, um, what are the what's the probability of after this collision like two photons sort of like shoot off in opposite directions like that and what you see is that as you get to higher and higher energies that probability gets lower and lower Got and lower it. and the reason is, is because at higher energies you can make heavier stuff right 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 what you see um what you would predict without a higgs boson is it just goes like this at higher energies you just lose those things but at 125 gev you see a little bump and what that bump is, is because at that energy, before decaying into other stuff, mm -hmm. you decay into a Higgs boson, mm -hmm. and the Higgs boson likes to turn into these things. Got and it. so you get an extra boost of these things at 125 GeV, and so we looked at that bump and we're like, that's the Higgs boson. Wow. So that's what we mean by seeing the Higgs boson. We kind of saw the effect of the Higgs boson at a very particular mass, which is why we can weigh the Higgs boson in a sense. Wow. So we're not. So you can't really make Higgs bosons because I think they live for like ten to the minus twenty-two seconds or something. Like they like completely they wiggle into everything else so fast. So before they get anywhere, remember, light goes a footprint nanosecond. These things are going the speed of light. 10 to the minus 22 seconds is 10 to the well, minus insanity. 12 times smaller than if so that's we're talking about like by the time it goes like a nucleus of an atom distance it's like decaying into something else um and so so yeah so anyways that's how we saw the higgs boson is we saw it's like an artifact of its existence but the cool thing about quantum mechanics is you don't need to smash higgs bosons you could anything if you want to make particles mm -hmm. you just need to get a lot of energy in a small amount of place and as long as the source of that energy is a field that causes one of your other fields to wiggle, then you're gonna make that particle. Sometimes there are fields that don't cause other fields to wiggle. For example, um, neutrinos mm -hmm. don't cause the electric field to wiggle. 
So you'll never now, be able to... neutrinos are these particles that come from the sun, right? Neutrinos are a particle that comes from, like... Are they traveling di- faster than the speed of Nothing. light? Is that, no. th- that Wasn't that a thing for a while? Yeah, those people <laughs> should not have published that paper. <laughs> I understand why they did. Basically, they did an experiment with neutrinos, and the results they got were that they're going faster than the speed of light. And they, they couldn't... were measuring underground, weren't they? they yeah, were... so neutrinos are so weakly interacting that okay. at nighttime, there is many neutrinos coming from the sun through the entire earth and then up through the ground at you as there are basically when it's daytime and they're just coming down at you that the earth hardly stops any of these things what's cool about that is that you can make neutrinos in china and then you could point the detector into the earth at chicago and you could sit in chicago and you can measure the neutrinos like so and then you might ask how do you measure them then and the answer is not very easily okay so like out of every like trillion neutrinos you measure like one (laughs) and so um so anyways they the LHC was making neutrinos in Switzerland. They shot it through the Earth at a detector in uh, Italy, um, and they re- were like, "Wait a second! The travel time is something's going wrong here." That's crazy. What they should have done, in my opinion, is they should have done said, "Well, they're certainly not going faster than light, so we're messing up somewhere," and then figured out where they were messing up. What they did instead was, okay, they assumed that at first, but they just couldn't find where they were messing up. Okay, and so they were like, "You know what?" we're just going to publish this thing because we can't ah, find what we're messing up. Okay. And so that created all kinds of speculation, okay. blah, blah, blah. Okay. And what people realized, and eventually we figured it out and it was like literally like two things, like one, like a plug wasn't like plugged in all the way. And so the fiber optic cable, you know, are you kidding there's me? That. And then another one was like a way that they were measuring like time had to do with like, a, they were using a satellite which wasn't taking, I think, like special relativity into consideration that it was like moving with respect to the observatory. So I mean, the fact, I mean, the fact it was going faster than the speed of light by a very tiny amount. Right. And so they couldn't really figure, but any effect would change that. And so once they figured out what the effect was, it was perfectly consistent with going slower than the speed of light. Why, why, why is that a, a finite number? Why, um, why is that? Why is a question that physicists try not to answer because, like, they're mm-hmm. a, unanswerable in any scientific sense. But, but everybody assumes it's, it's fact. But, yeah, but I could tell you, like, what, first of all, calling it the speed of light is historical. Okay. Light was the first thing that we found that went that fast. But it is not anything special to light. Mm-hmm. The speed of light should be renamed, from now and forever. The Maximum sp- velocity. <laughs> it should be called the speed of causality. Speed of causality. It is the speed at which effect follows cause. Okay. That basically, that information can only go at the speed of causality. It can only go. Okay. And so that is what the speed okay. is. There are many things that go that speed. Light, gravity, electrons at okay. very high temperatures. Well, it helps me above, understand right? it then. So it's just, we just call it the speed of light because that was a really fast thing that we learned about really early because our eyes are really sensitive. Interesting. Like, right? Um, and so... If you're massive, then the Higgs field slows you down. And so you don't go the speed of light. But if there were no Higgs field, everything would go the speed of light because everything would be going at the speed of causality. Um, the Higgs wow. field basically causes you to like meander in a way that like slows you down the same way that light goes slower through glass than it does through air. Um, that light trying to... know that? That's refraction, yeah. That's Refra- why, oh, that's the know, definition of refraction. Refraction is because light bends as it goes oh, into water. Like, yeah, like, in if water. Tra- and, if you're trying yeah. to stab a fish <laughs> like that, right? <laughs> that's like you're trying to catch a crayfish. It's The light is ch- bending. Why is it bending? Because light travels a different speed. Got it. Got it, got it, got, um, got it, got it, got it. Yeah, that's how they're trying to fund Elon Musk's space installation of internet things is that high frequency traders mm-hmm. will be able to talk to London and New York faster by going oh. into space and going that way than going along a fiber optic line through the Atlantic faster Ocean. Faster than fiber optic. Because fi- yeah, because light travels in glass 50% slower because glass is a medium that has an index of refraction. But for practicality, what, well, what kind of time frame are we looking at uh, difference that a wise. signal would go from something like 60 milliseconds to like 48 milliseconds or something and that benefits mankind in what way that benefits high frequency traders to become extremely wealthy but it doesn't benefit mankind in my opinion <laughs> high frequency traders would say that they're sort of like getting rid of arbitrage in the market or some stuff like that what pressing enter like the, the latency of pressing i don't get it. I'm, I'm i'm practically i don't understand how that works yeah, so we should get an economist on here to try and justify <laughs> high-frequency trading because, honestly, it's like, you know, a, a senator introduced a bill that was like, you can't trade faster than one second. 
and uh-huh. it immediately got like shut down that people were and, and because like finance people are like obsessed with this ability to like buy and sell things faster than one second intervals i never um, heard of that before yeah so basically like the mercantile exchange in chicago and the new york stock exchange um people spent billions of dollars to make another fiber optic line that went in a slightly straighter line that literally just got that information there a few milliseconds faster, but they spent billions of dollars doing it because they could put in their sell orders and their buy orders just a few micro, uh, milliseconds before the other people, and so then they can like take advantage of like small fluctuations. I would have never have thought that. It's totally insane. But I anyways, um, the speed of light is speed of causality, and even light itself travels at different speeds in different media. Particles travel at different speeds in different background. Yeah, but in field. a utopian circumstance, the Light will travel at the speed of causality. Exactly. Any mass at its, fa- at its fastest. Any massless particle will travel at the speed of causality. A photon is a massless particle. Mm-hmm. A graviton is a massless particle. Why? Because they don't interact with the Higgs field, and the Higgs field is what gives mass to other particles. So, if something travels faster than the speed of light, it's not from this Earth. We we we've never encountered it, right? It's we not, don't even have the math to support it. It's not from this bubble of the multiverse mm, that we universe. are. In. <laughs> exactly. The multiverse. It's not in our universe. It's not in our little bubble, right? There might be an another bubble where the speed of causality is different because maybe the speed of causality yeah. is related to the six dimensional folding of the Calabi-Yau manifolds. <laughs> we don't have an <laughs> alert. All right. Yeah. I want to end this by asking you, I'm, I'm going right. to go ahead and do it. I'm yeah. going to ask you this, this crazy question, take you out of the science realm. We talked a little bit before the show, UFOs. We do a UFO show on here. I like to use the term folklore. It's fun to talk about. I find it to be harmless. We're not doing anything destructive with society by discussing it, but the U.S. government, uh, I know you you haven't done a deep dive on this. Yeah. I kind of have the last year th- through the New York Times and other mm-hmm. disclosures from fighter pilots and so forth. It seems like our government is giving up information stating that there are unidentified objects out there moving in ways that we don't understand and things. Do you have any thoughts on that? Have you, I mean, you're, you, you're a guy that, that's pretty reflective. Have you ever thought <laughs> about the possibility that... that something out there has visited us or is possibly in control of this reality mm-hmm. anything far out like that what, what's your thoughts on that yeah there's a couple different thoughts i mean one thing from just like a very straightforward like the drake equation you probably mm-hmm. heard of that mm-hmm. has to do, i mean just kind of statistically ever since we learned and this is a recent thing like in the 90s we okay. learned that basically most stars have exoplanets around them right and there are in our galaxy alone something like 100 billion you know stars and so why would it be that there would be 100 billion planets Mm. around and that the biology would be a phenomenon that only happened on one of them so like from a very sort of simple framework it makes sense that like i believe that there are other sort of things that like waterfalls i believe happen on other planets Mm -hmm. like other sort of natural phenomena happen so why wouldn't there be biology right of course we don't have a narrative a scientific narrative as to how life started yet we have all sorts of ideas about rna world and like how it came in terms Mm -hmm. of dna once you get species then natural selection can take over from there but how you go from goop to dna is is an interesting Mm -hmm. question crawls out of the muck (laughs) yeah so like so maybe that might be so unlikely that that might only happen once per bubble in the multiverse right so it's possible we're alone but you know i like to think that we probably aren't now the question is like, what's my gut feel on if they've been here or something mm-hmm, like that? Mm-hmm. Um, in a kind of trivial sense, I think they might have. Life might have evolved, early life might have evolved on Mars. And in meteor collisions, which were much more frequent in the early solar system, regularly pieces of Mars would get chipped off and come to Earth. Um, we have meteorites that are from Mars yeah. that landed on Earth. Um, yeah. So in some sense, life on Earth might have started on Mars. We might be aliens in the sense that like we came from another planet or something. Um, life might have started somewhere else. Yeah. Um, but in the sense that is there intelligent life that has sort of like been here and visited and something like that? Okay, what I would say one should always keep in mind is that like physically going somewhere in the universe is very difficult simply because of this whole speed of causality thing right yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. the universe is very very big so even though there are you know many many stars like the andromeda galaxy is two and a half million light years away 
So just to go to Andromeda and back, right. even if you somehow found out how to like go the speed of light, which is like a very non-trivial thing, um, is still a five million year round trip. Um, and the universe has been around a long time, but like five million years is <laughs> one three thousandth of the total lifetime of the whole universe. Right. right? So that's like kind of far. So, um, <laughs> so yeah. So so okay. So basically, like, even if life did exist, it's going to be tough for life to like be around long enough like Got it. you know there are things that are 5 billion years light years away yeah and our sun is only going to burn for another 5 billion years so wow. like so like you know these are very these time scales are very relevant okay now the other thing to keep in mind is that to be a civilization that has the sort of technology to do this sort of thing it's very likely you are going to make use of electricity and ele electromagnetism's unique ability to be able to transmit information very okay. fast and be able to read it very reliably. Okay. It is very, neutrinos go very fast, but it's very hard to see them. And so you wouldn't make a car antenna that catches neutrinos, right? Gravity goes very fast, the speed of causality, but also it gave us a hell of a time just making one gravitational wave detector that's four kilometers big to see the most loud things in the universe from Got the perspective it. of gravitational waves. Got it. So we're not going to make a car antenna that reads gravitational waves. This is just the laws of physics in our universe. Mm -hmm. Say that electricity and magnetism is very strong. Things couple together very strongly. And okay. electromagnetic waves travel at the speed of causality. So any civilization is going to be constrained by physics is going to use electromagnetic phenomenon to like be like sending signals. Got it. Um, <clears throat> electromagnetic signals travel forever. Got it. That's why we can see galaxies that are 2 billion light years away because they can go that far. Even a faint little signal we could see from that yeah. far away. Yeah, yeah. So if there is a, and if there were some history in the last 15 or yeah, 15 billion years uh, of this, then we should, cause we can look back in time, right? When we look far away, we look back in time. Mm -hmm. So we can not only see really far away, we can see very far back in time somewhere in time that civilization, even if now they're able to cleverly hide themselves, right. would have been doing what we're doing. Got it. And what we're doing right now Got it. is just blasting radio <laughs> waves throughout right. the entire universe. If you were on Alpha Centauri, um, with sufficient technology, you'd be able to hear, listen to the radio on Earth. Right. Right? Like, the Voyager spacecraft was made in the 70s, yep. and we can still hear it, yep. and it is past the heliopause it is an interstellar space right now mm -hmm. and it's a dinky thing that is like the size of this table that was made in the 70s <laughs> and we can still with our technology can still hear this thing right. so like the earth is bright and loud and there is an organization called seti which is yeah, searching oh, yeah. for extraterrestrial yeah, intelligence yeah. and they are they're still rolling right they are yeah okay. and they're looking all over and i think you know say what you want about aliens ufos whatever i think they're doing a service a huge service to humanity and science which is by being like look it seems possible this could be there could be extraterrestrial life right. let's actually like listen for it It would be a big deal if we found it it would like, be a huge deal right and so let's actually listen for it. it's a scientific question whether or not there is life out there so the same way we build telescopes to look at stars why not build telescopes to look at much more interesting things like intelligence exactly right and so they're out there doing that and they have found really nothing of substance right and so for for me i am like I think that it is possible that aliens have been here, but it is an extraordinary claim for me to say that there have been because there are these reasons why it'd be hard to get here. Constraints. Because we Science would have constraints. probably heard some electromagnetic yeah. signal by now. And so this adage that I think everyone should live by, Bigfoot, UFO, whatever, is fine. Like you said, it's, it's fun to think about and talk about. Uh -huh. And I like, you know, thinking about things outside of the mainstream obviously but like the thing that you should always say to yourself is extraordinary claims require extraordinary, extraordinary. evidence absolutely right? and so if you see a youtube video of a thing released by nasa of a fuzzy thing that's moving that's in a way that's kind of weird it's totally fine to be like that looks like a ufo but the next step that a lot of people don't do is that would be an extraordinary event I need a lot of evidence to support that this is like not some trick of light, that this is not some sort of like technology yeah. that a government has been able to yeah, make, yeah, that, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. Like, you know, 
stealth fighters, SR-71 Blackbirds, like when these things were made, if those were spotted by somebody, you know, they would be like, what the heck is that? That isn't even in the realm of possibility of, like the SR-71 Blackbird, like planes weren't even shaped like that. Like how Got is that? It. So Got like, it. so the, yeah, so my point is just that, that that's a big claim and that like my bar for believing in that stuff is as high as the claim itself is, which is like a pretty big thing. Wow. Um, so I, I get it. Another kind of example that a very legit astronomer, Avi Loeb, mm-hmm. who um, was like, mm-hmm. I, I think just, he might still be the director of Harvard's astronomy I've department. I've just watched, he's, he's been in the news recently. Yeah, he's yeah. been making a splash, and people are a little mad at him for this, but I think it's, I'm not mad at him for okay. it. Okay. But basically, there was this object that came from another solar Uma system. Guma, I call yeah. it. <laughs> yeah, Oumuamua. Um, 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 um. Yeah. So this object um, is on a hyperbolic trajectory, meaning that it is not bound to the sun, that it right. will go past it and then leave and never come back it is going too fast to be captured by the sun it's like voyager right Mm -hmm. and the sun won't eventually slow it down stop it and bring it back it's gone Mm -hmm. um and oumuamua is an object that's like that and it had some interesting features to it its shape is kind of interesting based off of how it's reflecting light yeah it's very flat it's kind of like it's we 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 originally thought it was a cigar and now we think it's more of like a pancake um and it also as it was leaving the sun was accelerating which That's is kind of a strange thing for a yes. rock to do. Um, but again, one explanation is is that it was an interstellar visitor, which is a fine explanation, but you need a lot of evidence for that. Um, another explanation is that it was just like a piece of nitrogen ice, which is the current best explanation, I think. Um, when nitrogen ice gets close to the sun, it starts to sublimate. Okay. It goes from a solid to a gas. It skips the liquid phase altogether. And when it goes into a gas, it starts to like shoot off of it which causes okay. this thing it could like okay. be like a booster basically okay um and this happens all the time with comets Oumuamua is interesting in that, in that instead of just tumbling it's causing it to kind of speed up Got but it. this also happens sometimes a piece of nitrogen ice that big that size that shape like is that likely blah 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 people have worked out the numbers now and it seems like it's actually pretty likely um and so that's why whenever I got asked by many yeah, people, what about Avi Loeb mm-hmm. and the Sumuamua? My point is just that, like, that's a really big claim to say it's an interstellar swing. It's a less big claim to say that it's just like a ball of ice. And right. so I think the first thing we should do is figure out, could it be a ball of ice? Yeah. Um, and once we've exhausted all of these things, then we should start talking about this very bold claim yeah um whereas some people are like let's start with the bold claim <laughs> and, and <laughs> that's more, that's more sexy <laughs> it is and you know obviously got really f- you know he's now a household name uh-huh. to a lot of people because of that uh-huh. and, and and a lot of scientists think that that's like doing like a disservice to the practice of science which i can is, see that so though. yeah and i can so, see that i don't know it also generated a lot of really interesting discussion about meteors in the physics classes that I taught in the spring semester and so I don't really mind this kind of more audacious stuff a little bit as long as like it isn't like harmful to the actual practice of science. I think it's an interesting commentary on celebrity in science money in science money in media and media blending oh yeah you know because science people got to click on the article what are you going to do to make them click on the article? I think I think there's that there's that there's that money component to enter science and what's the easiest way to do that is is to you know make it self-explanatory to the masses people like Sean Carroll Brian Green you're a rock star uh, uh, theoretical physicists go out there and they do that you know I get it. there's a cottage industry there which I'm yeah. not saying it doesn't serve a value but I'm saying yeah this kind of plays into that I think to a degree. yeah and I think sometimes it's good sometimes it's bad one thing like this is just I'll just read a message from a couple of friends of mine who are having a discussion about this. There is a lot of research out there about space time being emergent from quantum mechanics. Mm-hmm, we talked about mm-hmm. it a little bit earlier. Um, and so instead of just sort of reporting on that idea and where it comes from and clarifying it, this article frames the whole thing as like, we may have finally proven Einstein wrong. And it's like, you want to get people to click on it. And so you create this antagonistic narrative of like Mm -hmm. this, like undefeatable genius who is now taken down by bold young whippersnappers. And it's like, 
that is not at all how this is working. Like Einstein is 100% right, mm -hmm. even if space-time is emergent, because he was talking about length scales in which general relativity applies, time scales well, in which general relativity applies. Those are the facts. Exactly. Facts aren't relative <laughs> exactly. in, in journalism in 2021. I mean, right. it's just yeah. not. So this is sort of the point, is that it's like people like to frame things in ways that sometimes are unhelpful to, to clarity, to understanding science. Certainly when it and, comes to science. Yeah. No and that's question. where Avi Loeb is sort of like, by framing that it is equally as likely, if not more likely, that it's an alien as it is that it's a piece of ice is doing a little bit of a disservice even though technically it's true that it's possible that. that it is an interstellar visitor like it's just that like you really shouldn't jump to that sort of thing you should acknowledge that it's possible but maybe explain why there are many other things that we should many other rocks to look underneath first before we no doubt you know so th that's that's all i'd say i don't i don't have a problem with people doing looking into like ufos and everything mm -hmm. i think that that's really cool and i really hope to live long enough that to like see we, <laughs> to see a ufo or something um it's just that like we need to sort of like have moderate expectations and we need to be looking at the evidence very Science carefully based. you know exactly thanks coop yep it was a pleasure dude i, I can't thank you this is another amazing afternoon <laughs> spent i appreciate it awesome yeah we'll it do it again soon too. absolutely all right friends yep. we're out take it easy hello you're listening to the eric mckenna project <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>